Great. Well, welcome. I hope everyone had a good lunch. Uh, my name is Alex Desherbinen, uh, and uh, I'm really pleased to chair this session because it's a particular interest of mine. Um, I've been working in the area of climate change induced migration uh, for a decade or so, and uh, one of the things that uh, we did was for the foresight project on global environmental change and migration is we did some global modeling, uh, indirect estimation of migration on a one kilometer basis everywhere in the world. And that work formed the basis of some of the key charts and graphs that appeared in that foresight report. And among them you would have seen, if you, if you recall, uh, or if you look at it today, uh, some charts that show just the extent of migration into coastal zones globally. It's um, uh, a phenomena that basically uh, is not differentiated by region substantially. Um, people are tending to move out of drylands, mountain areas, um, and other hinterlands. Uh, they're also moving into floodplains and other areas at risk. So this is a major concern. So with that, I'm going to just uh, ask our first speaker, Nora Schwaller, to come on up and to present. And we have a timekeeper here, Phoebe, who is going to keep you honest. So you will receive a five-minute warning, a three-minute warning, and something else, a one-minute. And if you want to leave any time for Q&A, we will allow you that within your 15-minute allocation, but you need to stop earlier. So thank you, Nora. Come on up. <laughs> and there's a, I'll yeah, let you I'll present. Great. Um, thank you all for coming to see this. I'm presenting on a project that I've been working on with a colleague, uh, Jordan, and it's on disaster conditions and population change. Just kind of a quick overview. We're just going to go through an introduction, concepts, the data results, and the policy implications that these might have. The problem that we started with was looking at how sea level rise and increasing major precipitation events will drive dramatic reduction in the availability of habitable land. However, we don't really understand how changing ri risk vulnerability and hazard exposure influences decisions to leave or the thresholds at which these decisions are made. So our question that we were asking was how does physical vulnerability of flooding and exposure to major storm events interact to influence population change over time in relationship to geographic conditions, which is the focus of this presentation. So the hypothesis that we were starting with was that there would be three conditions that would lead to population loss. Existing vulnerability, exposure to hazards, and exposure to riverine flooding as opposed to coastal flooding. Also that there would be interactions between these kind of concepts that would lead to additional flooding um, where two or more of these conditions are occurring. And that these kind of concepts that we were building into was the relationship between probabilistic and realized vulnerability uh, between points A and B, and also evaluation regarding the worthiness to protect, uh, where people tend to be more interested in mitigating and have more capacity to mitigate at coastal zones. So giving a kind of graphic understanding of how these concepts will be playing out um, on the Left side, we have Fair Bluff, North Carolina, under normal conditions where there isn't a major flood event. On the right side, we have projected flood conditions for a 15-foot increase in the river storm gauge levels. And North Carolina Feynman Network tracks how they think that this will impact buildings under these conditions. So kind of looking at that from the ground level, this is Fair Bluff, North Carolina, downtown. The arrows are pointing to the same building, so we're looking at kind of their downtown strip from different sides of the street. And this is kind of how it plays out when we have those vulnerabilities that are then realized on the arrow is still pointing to that same building. Uh, this was actually after two different storms. On the left, uh, this was post-Hurricane Matthew. It was paired with a news article in a local newspaper about Fair Bluff preparing to rebuild. And on the right, we have the same area after Hurricane Florence in 2018. However, there isn't really a linear relationship between 
prospective vulnerability or anticipated vulnerability and actual exposure to hazards. This is a picture of North Topsail Beach, what is quote unquote the most vulnerable home in North Carolina. Um, as a result of the natural setting plus poor development and management decisions, the town of North Topsail Beach on Topsail Island, North Carolina is the state's most vulnerable barrier island community. That was before Hurricane Florence. It was projected to be hit. This is after Hurricane Florence. It was pretty much fine. Uh, this house has actually been there for decades and has more or less weathered the various storms that have visited upon North Carolina's coast. And finally, kind of this concept, this final concept is um, looking at the capacity between places that are vulnerable to riverine flooding and inland areas and places that are vulnerable to coastal flooding. On the right is once again further down kind of top sail, North Topsail Beach. Um, they got a variance with their local planning board to put in this seawall. They've been doing multi-million dollar beach restoration projects for the last decade. Lumberton, North Carolina is still trying to get a levy put on their river. Uh, they have a, um, their city manager planner is, works part time. He works there one day a week. They just have very low capacity for being able to kind of implement these protective strategies. So the scope that we're looking at is for this period in North Carolina from 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2009. And we started with kind of collecting socioeconomic variables uh, just to get kind of a framework for what other conditions that are well established in the literature for establishing reasons why people might migrate or might have the capacity to migrate. And we pulled these from the 1980, 1990, and 2000 decennial censuses and normalized them to 2010 census boundaries. The variables that we were really testing here are disaster exposure risk and coastal conditions. Um, the disaster exposure were pulled from FEMA major disaster declarations for hurricanes from 1990 to 1999 and 2000 to 2009 with constructed with, the and the other two variables were constructed with geographic information. So basically we pulled the major disaster declarations for the state of North Carolina for these two decades and tracked which areas had been designated, which counties had been designated for individual assistance. One kind of piece of note is that there were different amounts of storms that were experienced over these two decades, which is a point that I will get back to at the end. In the first decade, um, there were a number of storms and one county might have had a maximum of five disaster declarations over that period. In the second decade that we were looking at, uh, there were less storms, they were considerably less severe, and the maximum amount of counties that had, the maximum times a given county was, had a disaster declaration that opened them up for individual assistance was only two. And this is just kind of giving you an idea of the geographic distribution of these disasters over this period. Uh, so of course we have coastal conditions where they are more vulnerable. However, there's a lot of inland conditions where they received pretty dramatic flooding as well. For risk, uh, we looked at the Microsoft building footprint data that was recently released and overlaid them with North Carolina flood maps and made a census tract level variable that said the X percentage of buildings are within the 100 year floodplain in a given census tract. Uh, this does introduce a little bit of error because the Microsoft building footprint data only came out recently and doesn't track back through decades, um, but this was kind of the metric that we were using. And for coastal conditions, uh, we'd use two measures. If a census tract was touching the coast, then it was considered a coastal census tract, or if it was in a certain distance of the coast, um, mapping the centroid of the census tract to the coastal line uh, to get to kind of account for these skinny census tracts on the edge. And so what we found are in these two tables broken down from uh, by decade. And I'm just going to zoom in on kind of these more important variables that we were considering. So from 1990 to 2000, um, looking at Model A, we just kind of tracked these three base variables on their own. And disasters um, at the county level were associated with population loss and percent of buildings within a census tract that are in high risk areas of the 100 year floodplain are associated with population loss, and this was statistically significant. However, coastal conditions um, weren't statistically significant. When we looked at how these started to play out with interaction terms, when we had the interaction between disasters and high-risk areas, these as individual uh, variables were still significant, but the interaction term wasn't. Um, 
And when we did the interaction term between high risk areas and coastal conditions, we actually had a significant positive coefficient so that these, the interaction of these two um, variables was actually associated with population gain over this period. Looking at how these things changed in the following decade, disasters are no longer significant um, in this period for population loss. So we think that this is in part because there were less disasters during this time. And so maybe there were conditions where people were like, okay, I've been hit once. I had my one in 100 year flood. I'm okay. Um, percent of high risk, percent in high risk was still significant. And at this point, the interaction between high risk and coastal conditions had switched to a, a significant negative coefficient. So switching back to our hypotheses, um, looking at population loss will be caused by existing vulnerability. Yes, people who are in census tracts that are dominated by buildings that are in 100 year floodplains are leaving these census tracts. We're seeing population loss. Exposure to hazards, probably. We saw that in our first decade, but not in our second decade. And we think that this is a condition where if there are enough hazards that are happening over and over again, kind of thinking back to that picture that we had of Matthew and Florence in Fair Bluff, then people are very, become very much aware of their risk and they will leave. And exposure to river marine flooding um, versus coastal flooding, we didn't really see anything of evidence here at this time, although we did control for a lot of other socioeconomic factors that may have been related. Building that out to these interaction terms, um, between existing vulnerability and exposure to hazards, we don't have evidence to support that the relationship between these two factors really um, leads to increased population loss. Between exposure to hazards, uh, existing vulnerability and exposure to riverine flooding, we have that polarity change in the coefficient between the first decade and the second decade. It's possible that this is an increased awareness to climate change. It's possible that it's related to a number of other factors, including but not limited to the boom and bust cycle that happened in that decade. And as far as exposure to hazards in the relationship to coastal or riverine flooding, we don't have evidence to support that there's a connection between these two or that the connection between these two variables leads to increase or decrease population loss. So as kind of the main takeaways, first, the existence of conditions of high vulnerability within the 100-year floodplain is significantly correlated with population loss. This indicates that, in aggregate, individuals within these zones are aware of their risk and are interested in mitigating it via relocation. The awareness of this risk is not dependent on the realization of this risk. However, the repetition of major disaster events may push communities towards tipping points where their pre-existing settlements are no longer considered viable. And the relationship between hazards and coastal conditions is complicated, and coastal areas have faced increased development and rising housing values. However, the change in the polarity of this effect, uh, effect coefficient for this variable indicates that we may be reaching increased awareness of the dangers and risks inherent in coastal living. So the policy suggestions that these kind of relate to, first, we should invest more in pre-disaster mitigation or relocation. People are willing to move from areas that are higher risk, and they should have the support to enact such mitigation measures in non-emergency situations. There may be different residents, these may be different residents than the one typically involved in post-disaster buyouts and relocation programs. And communities where they're facing population loss need support to face that problem. While we may not know which areas will be hit by the next disaster, we do know which areas have this existing vulnerability that we can anticipate. People seem to be reacting to a repeat events differently. Post-disaster recovery efforts may need to reflect the shift in perspective. Recovery should look different when it needs to come again and again. And finally, we need more data on how people react to coastal communities. If the shift we saw from population gain to population loss is reflective of a change in that attitude rather than just kind of a fact of other conditions going on at the time, then we're gonna see a pretty dramatic shift in coastal value that we'll need to account for. Thanks. <laughs> Questions? Yes, a question in the back. Just shout it out. Uh, 
Um, yes, those are factors that are highly um, important, and they really factor into population change. Uh, so we accounted for a lot of those in our um, socioeconomic variables, which I kind of glossed over. So we have previous population change to account for existing trends that are already happening. Uh, we did percent 18 or younger and 60 or older, um, and percent urban, um, as well as some other factors to kind of account for those existing trends. Um, okay, with that, I thank you very much, Nora. Very interesting work. So we're going to move on. We're going to move on to uh, flood risk perception and resulting outcomes of population movement along among coastal residents of Lagos, Nigeria, with Susan Eco or Eco Eco presenting. Let's get your presentation up. I'm going to let Phoebe take over. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's presentation. Um, my name is Susan Eko. I am a PhD student at SUNY ESF in Syracuse, New York. So in keeping up with the theme for this session, which is on migration as adaptation, I'll be sharing with you my research project, my dissertation, which is looking at coastal flood, flood risk perception among residents in Lagos and how that might influence future anticipatory migration decisions. And this research project is, in, is still in its early stages, so the goal of this presentation is to share with you what the problem is, to share with you why it's important, to share with you about how this research will be addressed. And at the end of this presentation is my desire to be able to pull from the experts in this room to get comments, ideas, questions on how to possibly move this project further. And to get to how it all started for me. So last year, I was opportune to follow and report on the Global Compact for Migration in New York. And this process was really important because in objective two of the um, Global Compact for Migration, member states really came to an agreement, the ones that actually um, followed through and endorsed the Global Compact for Migration. What they did was they recognized that climate change is a possible driver of migration. And they especially specifically mentioned slow onset and sudden onset disasters. But what this raises, the question that it raises that we really need to look into is who moves? Um, do people all decide to move? What are the factors that play into the decision-making process of determining whether to move in the future or not when faced with these climate change risks? And why is this important? It is important to look at this because currently there is no legal recognition for climate refugees. And this is important for immigration policy. Um, those authors there have stated that um, we're seeing increase in immigration policies that are terror hysteria, which basically targets certain groups of people based on their religion, based on what they look like, and we're trying to avoid that if we're going to have climate refugees. Um, it's also important because of climate adaptation policy because we want to have policies that are culturally relevant, biophysically relevant, and socially relevant. And so at the end of this, I feel like what is really important is that we look at this from different local contexts and different regional contexts, because depending on the place where we're at, people are going to have different responses to climate change risk. And in line with this, I decided to focus on a case study on Lagos, Nigeria. And Lagos is important for so many reasons. First of all, Lagos is an urban coastal megacity. And Lagos has a population of about 21 million people and is projected to double in size by 2050. Lagos is also a national economic capital and regionally is also like a huge economic hub. But from a rural to urban 
context in terms of urbanization, I like to call this as Lagos is the city of last resort. And why I say this is because a lot of people in the country of Nigeria see Lagos as the target of places to move to from, up, from rural areas to urban areas. And so when we have this situation where everybody wants to come to a particular city, but that city itself is vulnerable to climate change, how do we ad address the possibility of climate migrants and where they might move to when that city cannot be lived in anymore? And so the vulnerability of Lagos has been established by scientific studies in the literature. Um, up there, we can see two images of maps that show the high risk of vulnerability of Lagos compared with the rest of Nigeria. There are other studies that have also stated that it's because of its low level elevation. And um, the study by Riveni especially states that in the absence of the traditional sense of adaptation, about three million people could be displaced from this city in the future. Um, in 2012, there, were like huge, there was a huge flooding event that happened across Nigeria, and it has been stated that this flooding event has been the worst in the past 40 years. It resulted in mass displacements of people and loss of lives. And flooding events have been on the increase in Lagos within the past decade, within the past few years. Interestingly, um, to show the effect of climate change upon flood risk, usually the rainy season in Lagos is between April and in June, but now we're getting rains, intensive rains in other months of the year. So in January, for example, there are like huge flooding events happening. But apart from these scientific studies, we also have on the ground experiences of people communicating how vulnerable they are to flood risk how they're concerned about climate change and how they're concerned about floods. The first example on the left, um, I don't know if it's clear up there, but you can see how flooding has impacted those people in that neighborhood. To be able to get to work, they have to use canoes to get to work. On the right side, this is actually from last week. And this is after a flooding event. And we can see how they've created an economy where people have to carry others on their backs to be able to get from point A to point B. And they charge about 28 cents to get that done. In January, I conducted a poll on my Twitter account. And basically, I was just interested in seeing how people are concerned about climate change and how people are concerned about the increase in flooding events. And even though this lasted for just 24 hours and I had 14 responses, more than half of the people that responded said that they were concerned about the increase in flooding events. And if you go onto Twitter now and you click Lagos flooding, you will see a lot of conversations happening about these events because it really impacts the everyday lives of the people that live there. And so we've established the fact that Lagos is vulnerable to climate change, but what really is a question that hasn't really been put forward is how this might affect potential anticipatory migration decisions. So people are faced with a perceived risk of a flooding event, either due to prior experiences with flooding or due to anticipated risk of flooding happening and impacting them, but how do they respond to that? Do they think about moving as an option? So that is what I'm trying to get at with my research. And those are the questions I'm looking at specifically. I'm looking at risk perceptions. I'm looking at if the risk perceptions influence future movement outcomes. But also, I'm interested in seeing how different social vulnerability factors play into migration outcomes. I think this is important because it gets at the privilege of moving, because not everybody is able to make that decision to move. So by looking at the intersection of different characteristics, identities, and vulnerabilities, I'll be able to see how different people make that decision. So. Uh, Older, more educated males more likely to decide to move than younger, uneducated females. How does that play in um, people who own lands versus renters and people who are of high income versus low income? So looking at the different intersec intersections of those vulnerabilities, really will be able to target appropriate policies and programs to addressing future migration. 
And some of the um, concepts that play into my questions, help me to frame my questions, include the concept of vulnerability, as we all know, intersectionality, which has been argued that is necessary to apply to vulnerability studies, risk perception, looking at perceived risk of future events happening, and multi-causality hypotheses. I think that last one is really important because when we're studying climate change-induced migration, it's important to note that people will not move only just because of, a climate, of climate change. The other traditional drivers of migration, as we all know it, are part of what plays into migration decisions. So we have to look at it at the factors from the macro scale to the micro scale to the meso scale, as Black puts it. And so I've applied this multi-causality hypothesis, specifically looking at the macro drivers to Lagos, Nigeria. When we're looking at the economic drivers of migration, people have historically and presently continued to move for employment opportunities, and major international destinations include the UK, the US, Gulf states, Canada. And what is interesting to me now, presently, is that there are a lot of young people who are taking advantage of the Canadian skilled workers migration program. So a lot of people are moving for that reason. But it will be also interesting to see how people's exposure to flood risk, continuous flood risk, plays into and interacts and intersects with this economic driver. So we also have political factors, um, polit political drivers, which are ethnic crisis, insecurity, and persecution. I want to speak specifically about persecution because recently security operatives in Lagos have been targeting young males, and this has resulted in the loss of lives of a lot of young males. And this is a result of how they look, how they dress, and they're specifically targeted and impacted. So that could be a contributing driver of migration. Demographic, demographic factors, which looks at the continuous population growth and expansion. In the earlier session, Dr. Ajibade um, spoke about how developments, new developments are occurring on the Atlantic Ocean. It's a way to expand the city to accommodate the huge pool of people that are in the city, but what we're finding is that, that pro those kind of projects are benefiting the wealthy and pushing the urban poor further away into slum settlements. So people who are already vulnerable to climate change, being pushed further into vulnerability has huge implications. We also have the social factors, which is movement for higher education. U.S. is a major destination. U.K. is a major destination. And even though I've presented international destinations, migration is not only an international thing. People move internally. But what's interesting and for me, like I feel like is a question that needs to be asked, is that since Lagos is the choice destination, there really isn't anywhere else for them to go to um, they might choose more international ways for those who have the ability to move. And so my conceptual framework really is taking the individual as the unit of analysis, but understanding that the individual fits into a family, fits into a community, but seeing how they make the decision to move or to stay my chosen methods for this research project is a combination of qualitative and quantitative methods. The quantitative method is to test empirical relationships, as I've stated, um, to see the intersectionalities of factors that produce different migration outcomes. But the interviews and focus groups as a qualitative method is to get at, at the local perspective. So I want to be able to capture the voice of the people stating what the risks are, how they perceive the risk, and what are the factors that play into their decision making. And focus groups especially for me I think will be important to get at the community dynamics of mobilization, how or if they might mobilize as a community rather than individuals. The research design will involve spatial analysis of flood prone areas in coastal Lagos, but then using that to identify specific um, survey respondents. And for the qualitative data is true um, partnerships with neighborhood associations to identify people to interview and to um, be included in the focus group discussions. 
And so I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, um, what I've been able to communicate, or I hope that you will continue to think about, is that migration as an ad adaptation strategy is important and needs to be given due consideration. It's important to also look at local and regional perspectives because different regions have unique needs. But also, anticipatory migration, most times we look at it from a forced displacement um, when we're studying climate change induced migration, but it's also important to look at how people anticipate risk and if they plan for future migration decisions. So thank you. I would like to receive questions, comments, feedback. Uh, so we have time for a very brief question. I guess I was just going to make one comment, which is that um, a lot of people may just move to other parts of Lagos. So is that going to be part of your framework? Because it sounded like international migration was the only migratory response that you were considering. Oh, no, it's not. So part of the questions is asking people, first of all, if they would choose to move, because not everybody makes that decision. Sure. And secondly, where they would like to move to, where they would choose to move to. So which might be parts of Lagos, that's part of the question. Would you move within Lagos? Would you move to another city in Nigeria? Or would you move okay. across the board? Great. I must have misunderstood that. Thank you, Susan. So let's go ahead and move to our next presenter. Uh, we have impact of Rohingya crisis on the resilience of coastal community in Bangladesh, GIS and remote sensing analysis of deforestation by Saqib Imtiaz of Disaster Management Watch. Thank you, Saqib. Should I bring Theo? Uh, not yet. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Sakib Imtiaz from Bangladesh. Um, this is totally my personal research. Uh, I am presenting uh, my study uh, on the impact of Rohingya crisis on the resilience of the coastal community of Bangladesh, GIS and satellite remote sensing analysis of deforestation. Um, at first, I would like to say that these Rohingyas are not climate refugees or climate migrants. They are displaced by the ethnic conflict, but somehow they are related to coastal resilience and the climate change. So through my presentation, I will make the linkage with the resilience and uh, specifically the issue of deforestation. Okay, let's talk about uh, some background of this uh, Rohingya crisis. The latest Rohingya refugee influx began since 25th August of 2017, and now approximately 655,000 refugees settled in Bangladesh, and most of them settled in the Teknaf and Ukia. And these areas are the part of Cox's Bajay region, which is the uh, most popular tourist spot in Bangladesh. And also, it is famous for its longest natural sea beach. And this region is one of the most climate vulnerable um, regions in Bangladesh. Uh, when Rohingya people came to uh, Bangladesh, a massive deforestation um, was observed due to the rapid expansion of the refugee uh, settlements and also their practice of uh, cutting trees for cooking purpose because they collect uh, firewood every day from the forest. And this forest of uh, these regions uh, of the Teknaf and uh, Ukia plays a vital role in the climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation uh, process. So this degradation of forest uh, um, increased the vulnerability and it is uh, linked to a loss of ecosystem related issues like the landslide and biodiversity losses. Uh, you can uh, uh, see this uh, picture. It is, uh, it is not the whole study area, uh, but this is a part of, um, uh, this is the Kutupalung refugee camp, which is the world largest refugee camp right now. So you can uh, see uh, here is the, uh, a significant deforestation um, took place uh, here. Uh, the uh, first picture taken on the, uh, before the influx uh, from uh, February 8, 2017, and the second one uh, taken on the February 28, 2018, after 
the influx. This is the picture of Ukiya. Uh, the objective of uh, my study uh, is to address the trend of forest cover uh, change uh, following the refugee influx and to recommend policies in response to this crisis. The study area, the two adjacent sub-districts of Costas Baja regions um, under the division of Chittagong, and uh, uh, this um, sub-districts are Teknaf and Uki Ukiya. Also, it includes the Teknaf Wildlife uh, Sanctuary, which is the oldest reserve forest situated in this uh, place. And the study area excludes the San Martin Island because uh, no uh, refugee settlements exist there. Data and methodology uh, part, uh, I use the GIS and remote sensing technique uh, to address uh, the deforestation. I use the Landsat 8 data, um, 8 data uh, with the 30 meter spatial uh, resolution and uh, uh, I use the band 1 to 7 and 9 and data of, you can see the data of acquisition for the, uh, for five consecutive uh, years, uh, 4 December 2014, 7 December 2015, 23 November 2016, 28 December 2017, and 2 March, uh, sorry, the 2nd March in 2018. And I use the secondary um, information from you, including the UN document to find out the consequences of deforestation uh, and how it relates to resilience uh, issues of this uh, region. Uh, the widely used uh, um, equation, I use the NDVI uh, method. Uh, I use this uh, equation of the NDVI, band 5 minus band 4 divided by uh, band 5 plus band 4. And for the classification NDVI scheme, I use the USGS uh, 2017 um, standard. Uh, I also, I use the uh, pixel-based calculation to quantify the forest cover of this uh, region. These are the NDVI uh, values that are specified by the USGIS uh, standard. Um, uh, so uh, th this is actually the findings. Um, you can see um, uh, the vegetation cover of uh, four um, consecutive year and Rohingya influx um, started since 2017. So um, in just after the 3.5 months of Rohingya influx, we uh, can see a drastic change in the vegetation cover. You can see a total vegetation cover decreased by 2,099.34 hectares in total of the Teknaf and uh, uh, Ukiya region. Uh, another assessment for the Teknaf Wildlife uh, Sanctuary, which is situated in this uh, region, uh, you can see here is uh, the total vegetation cover also decreased by 102.87 hectares in this uh, region at the uh, same time. So that was the uh, main findings uh, of the deforestation in these um, areas. Now we'll uh, show uh, some secondary information uh, of the uh, Rohingya crisis and the cri climate resilience issues. UN organization, along with Bangladesh government, did a disaster risk assessment in that uh, refugee settlements. So um, uh, the findings were that uh, 246,600 estimated refugees were at uh, risk of landslides or floods and 41,751 estimated refugees were in the areas at highest risk of landslides and prioritized for the relocation in the nearby uh, comparatively safer places. So finally, the, uh, 24,401 refugees have been relocated from the areas uh, at highest risk of relocation. But uh, 20,030 20, refugees uh, uh, still remain in the areas of the uh, landslide vulnerable places, and they are also prioritized for the relocation. Uh, these are the some uh, disaster incidents um, occurred in the refugee um, settlements. Um, uh, most of these uh, uh, disasters are related to rainfall during the monsoon period, that is 11 May to 18 September 2018. Uh, the first column represents the number of incidents. The second column represents um, the persons, number of persons affected uh, due to the disaster. And the third column, the affected number of affected households. You can see the landslide uh, number of incidents, uh, 334 incidents of landslide 
201 incidents of strong uh, wind and storm, 47 incidents of flood, and 16 incidents of fire, and uh, also 42 incidents of water logging in these areas. So from the above uh, data, um, I identified some uh, consequences of deforestation. Um, uh, deforestation on the resilience of this coastal community, um, where uh, you can uh, see, the, uh, I already discussed about the landslide and wind storm or cyclone issues previously. Uh, another one is the human and elephant conflict um, here. The, uh, because uh, this refugee camp falls within the corridor of the elephant, uh, which was being used by the elephant to uh, migrate from one, um, one forest to another forest. But now uh, these uh, areas are occupied by the refugees. So uh, nine people were killed by the elephant attack so far in these uh, regions. Now, the, uh, some policy recommendation as well as some uh, general recommendation uh, from the, the study. The future uh, climate change adaptation policy for Bangladesh needs to incorporate a strategy for the areas of Rohingya refugee settlements and also the host community. And um, we need to establish a climate resilient humanitarian response framework consider considering the natural resource management during humanitarian crisis, because uh, uh, this is a new types of uh, uh, crisis in Bangladesh. We don't have that types of any framework. And uh, uh, we need to involve the UNFCC uh, in this crisis. IOM and UNHCR are already working in these uh, issues, but uh, UNFCC is absent uh, uh, from the time being. Uh, and in case of the long-term aspect, uh, if they stay here for a long time, the government need to think about relocate uh, these refugees in different parts of the country uh, gradually. Uh, actually, in 2018, um, government uh, took an initiative to uh, retreat uh, uh, these areas that try to plant vetiver grass. Uh, vetiver grass is a st um, special types of grass which can hold soils and prevent from the landslides in that area, but um, a significant uh, portion of that uh, grass has died due to the wrong timing and the places. So uh, the implementing agency should receive uh, proper training on the plantation, otherwise it will not be effective, the forest restoration uh, program. Then uh, we need to scale up the environment-friendly uh, technology um, for cooking, such as the LPG uh, gas cylinders uh, or the improved cook stoves, so that we can reduce the pressure on the fire rate. Uh, these things are uh, already uh, going on in this uh, place, but we just need to scale up these initiatives. Uh, so that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. If you have any question, I went so fast. Maybe. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so keep stay up here with us for a second. Okay, so this uh, illustrates some of the important issues, not necessarily of a climate-induced uh, or coastal retreat uh, into an area that's vulnerable, but m what might happen in areas where, especially in parts of the world where you know there's less, say, government inter intervention or people kind of create squatter squatter camps or that mm -hmm. sort of thing. Um, that uh, are, you know, kind of their refuge away from the coastal zone. So are there any questions for Seki before we move on to the next presenter? Yes, go ahead. If you could hit the button and speak to the microphone, thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask, this is really interesting research, um, and I think a big driver for a lot of IDP questions within uh, Myanmar at large. I, Bangladesh is obviously not Myanmar, but for other communities, from Myanmar dealing with the same issues. Um, what have you heard or what do you feel you might speak to that within, that would be s options for the resettlement of Rohingya within Bangladesh? How do you, how, what do you feel like would be important aspects for that to be successful? 
Yeah, I suggest to relocate. <laughs> yeah, I suggest to relocate them in different parts of the country because now they all the refugees, uh, approximately one million in total, the previous uh, influx and this influx, one million refugees are staying in the same place. So it is uh, risky for my country as well as for the ecosystem in this place. So I think government should uh, gradually relocate them in the other parts of the country as well. But it's the controversial. Uh, may uh, other scholars will uh, not be agreed with me. Um, because they want to keep them in the confined areas. That's the thing. The government has already planned to relocate them, uh, uh, some of the refugees into an island, in a remote island. Uh, it's uh, called the Fashion Chor. Great. So we'll move ahead with the next presenter. Thank you okay, very much, thank you very much. Um, So our next presenter is Ama Francis from the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law, our hosts here. And uh, Amma will be presenting on image, uh, sorry, regular migration pathways for climate migrants leveraging free movement of persons frameworks to facilitate climate induced migration. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Alma Francis. I'm a climate law fellow at the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law here at Columbia Law School. Um, so we've been given this provocation of thinking about migration as adaptation. And I think if migration is actually going to be a realistic adaptation strategy, we need to be making it easier for people to migrate um, safely and to safety. And I'm going to be talking about one way of doing that, which is free movement agreements. So as we all know, disaster displacement, which the Nansen Initiative defines as forced displacement related to disasters, including the adverse effects of climate change, is a global challenge. That's where, why we're all here. Um, over 200 million people have been displaced by disasters in the period of 2008 to 2016. Every year, millions of people are displaced by floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, and other um, forms of environmental degradation. Most of this movement, as um, my colleague Susan mentioned, happens within borders, so internally, but some migrants are actually forced to move across borders, so go to other countries. Um, and the family pictured here is one such family. Um, they're from Dominica, which is an island in the Caribbean. In this picture, they're shown at the ferry terminal um, about to depart to another nearby country, St. Lucia. Um, and this was after Hurricane Maria struck Dominica in 2017. I'm going to actually start the presentation with a short video on Dominica to introduce the island and also the island's experience with Hurricane Maria. Uh, hopefully this works. It sits at 15 degrees north, 61 degrees west. It was christened White Tikabuli by the native Indian population, which means tall is her body. It was the last island in the Caribbean to be colonized. Its 73,000 residents are spread over the 290 square miles of mostly mountainous, green, lush, rugged terrain and are kept hydrated by unprecedented 365 rivers and eight breathtaking waterfalls. It's Wednesday, September 20th, 2017. As dawn breaks, a satellite reveals the colossity of a slow-moving monster carrying a payload of heavy rainfall and winds in excess of 175 miles per hour. In her wake, the sun rises over the sea and the Commonwealth of Dominica lays shattered. Its people overwhelmed and the devastation likened to a country ravaged by war. Hundreds of Dominicans pack the port almost on a daily basis, trying to flee the mud, malaise, and miserable post-apocalyptic living conditions left by Maria. Um, so as we saw in the video, Hurricane Maria devastated Dominica. 
90% of roofs were either damaged or destroyed. My own grandmother lived without a roof for a month. Um, and because most homes were destroyed, about 20% of our population was forced to permanently leave the island. To put that in US terms, that's like if 65 million Americans were displaced by a single event. Um, Displacement in Dominica is actually the largest, um, the highest incident of disaster displacement that's been recorded to date relative to population size. Unfortunately, Dominica is not unique in its displacement risk. Um, small island states in terms of population size are actually among the top 10 countries um, experiencing dis disaster displacement. Uh, SIDS, small island developing states, have relative levels of displacement that are three times the average for all other countries in the world combined. The Bahamas, which has the highest level of displacement risk relative to population size in the world, can expect to have 5.9% of its population displaced every single year, and that's just internally. But luckily, um, there's good news. The international community has started to respond to disaster displacement. Um, in 2010, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the UN framework for addressing climate change, recognized human mobility and migration as a challenge, as a climate issue for the first time in 2010. In 2015, the landmark Paris Agreement set up a task force to address displacement, um, to address avert and minimize risk associated with displacement. And actually, at the recent COP um, in Poland, at the recent climate talks, they actually endorsed countries endorse recommendations of that task force. Most recently in 2018, um, the Global Compact was endorsed. My colleague Susan mentioned this. The Global Compact is the first international framework on migration. It was endorsed by 164 countries and it recognizes that climate change is a driver of migration. The thesis of the Global Compact is that we should be making it easier for climate migrants to move, for all migrants to move across borders. So when we think of migration, I think it's common to think of migration as an act of desperation or a crisis. And the thesis of the Global Compact is by making increasing regular migration pathways or legal options for people to move, we can transform migration into an opportunity. Free movement agreements, which increase the legal options for people to move, are one way to increase regular migration pathways, and that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about. So what are free movement agreements? Um, free movement agreements basically liberalize the movement of people between member state countries within the same region. Policies can be as simple as removing visa requirements for entry into another participating country. Um, they also give rights to live, work um, and re sometimes permanently resettle in another state. They are, these agreements can also be more complex. They can um, recognize professional skills across borders or even allow people to transfer their social security rights. It's important to say that when I'm talking about free movement agreements, I'm not talking about open global borders. Um, these are actually regional trade agreements that contain provisions within them that allow for free, easier movement of people within participating states. The most common example is the European Union, um, but every region in the world has some sort of agreement like this. Um, most often, as I mentioned, these are trade agreements. They're linked, these agreements are linked to a common market. Um, so basically it gives workers the right to enter, work, and resettle in member states. But free movement agreements can apply to other categories of persons like students or even refugees. In the Caribbean, we have two regional organi organizations with free movement protocols, CARICOM, um, which is the Caribbean community, and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. CARICOM gives CARICOM nationals, there are 15 member states, um, so any national of any of those 15 member states has the right to enter another country that participates in the agreement without a visa, stay for six months, and that stays often extendable. Um, OECS, the Organization for Eastern Caribbean States, is even more generous. Um, any OECS national has the right to enter another country, stay indefinitely, and work without applying for a permit. So if you're from St. Kitts, which is an island 
Ireland that participates in the organization, then you can migrate to another country, Antigua, for example, not have to have a visa, um, stay for as long as you want, and seek work without having to apply for any sort of permit. In the 2017 Atlantic hurricane season, um, which was the season that gave us Hurricane Maria um, and a number of other really important hurricanes, um, these both CARICOM and OECS provided protection for climate migrants. It allowed many people to migrate to nearby islands, seek work, and in some cases permanently resettle. For example, um, Dominicans were welcomed by Trinidad, um, Antigua, St. Vincent, and a number of other islands after the storm. My own mother lives in Barbados right now under one of these agreements. Um, and these agreements are not only solutions for Caribbean climate migrants. As I mentioned, 120 countries around the world participate in some sort of free movement agreement. So this is a scalable solution. I wanted to focus, stop and pause and focus on something that's happening right now. The Intergovernmental Authority on Development in Africa, IGAD, is currently negotiating its own regional free movement protocol. And their, part of their protocol is a particular article that focuses on disaster displacement. I wanted to highlight this because most free movement agreements, even though they're useful in this disaster displacement context, aren't agreements that were designed to provide protection to climate migrants. But in Eastern, in Africa, where this is, um, where this is being developed, they're actually shaping their protocol around the needs of disaster displaced persons. One of the most exciting things in the draft version of this protocol, hopefully it passes, is that people who are affected by disasters will be able to access the benefits of the agreement, no matter, regardless of whether they've been affected by any sort of flood or um, environmental event, and also they'll be able to access these benefits and travel to other countries without travel documents. So for example, if you're from Kenya and you lost your passport in a flood, you would still be able to migrate to Uganda um, under this agreement. That's hugely important because of the, the, the disruptive um, effect of these of environmental occurrences on people's lives and, and access to documents that make sure that people have the right to enter another place, um, live and work. So there are three major reasons I think free movement agreements make sense um, for disaster displacement in terms of um, enhancing solutions that we have in the absence of international legal protection for climate migrants. The first is that free movement agreements are regional. So as my colleague Susan mentioned, most migration is regional. Even though we think of migration as being from often I think movement from the global south to the global north, actually the majority of migrants move within their own region. Free movement agreements, which are regional agreements, allow people to move interregionally. Also, it's really hard to separate out the climate signal from people's movements. So often you hear about the combination, the multi-causality of climate migration. So it's hard to say that someone's moving just for climate. With free movement agreements, it doesn't matter why you're moving. You can still access the benefits. They also build community and individual resilience, like any migra migration is adaptation option. Um, and migration allows people to have greater access to sending remittances home, um, to sharing skills, and to building social networks across borders. And finally, um, in this context, the international community has definitely made strides in addressing disaster displacement, but it is still a political challenge. And in the, in the context of that, these regional agreements, which are easier to negotiate um, between countries that often have a similar level of economic development and share cultures, um, are more politically feasible. So to end, I just want to leave you with three points. Um, Migration is adaptation is great, um, but if that's actually going to be realistic, we need to be making it easier for people to migrate across borders. Free movement agreements are existing operating ex agreements in 120 countries in the world, um, and they increase migration options for people. And because of this, they need to be part of the international legal framework um, and policy response to disaster displacement. Happy to talk more now or in the Q&A after. Thank you for listening. Time for one 
Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. So um, the Caribbean region, as I'm sure we know, or if you don't know, you should know this, um, the majority of the islands were colonized, and some islands are, most islands are independent now, but there are some islands that are still territories of, of the U.S. or um, the Dutch government, et cetera, France. Um, so those islands that are territories often are associate members of these agreements, but not full members. So they don't participate, they participate in CARICOM, for example, um, but they don't actually participate in our free movement protocol. So if you're from Martinique, which is a French owned, which is a French territory, um, you would not have the right to migrate to Dominica, um, although Technically, actually, you can migrate without a visa because of just French nationals being able to do that, but you wouldn't participate in the agreement. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Thank you, Emma. Okay, so next up we have uh, Carlos Martin from, uh, or Martin? Martin. Martin from the Urban Institute, Where Migrants Go, Patterns in the Post-Disaster Reception and Long-Term Outcomes for Relocated Households in Receiving Communities. All I'm right. going to let our expert take care of it. <laughs> oh, you're ready? Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I realize we're in a post-lunch scenario, and so I want to make sure um, we're all still here. Um, but I certainly the, my four predecessors certainly set up the, the opportunity for us to think a little bit more thoroughly about these intersections between migration, migration theory and studies, and um, adaptation, um, which I find uh, very heartening. I, th I think I've, I would also extend a bridge to the equity panel that occurred earlier. I know uh, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is similar to Alice Kasman's presentation. There she is. So um, I'm, I'm talking about where migrants go. So we, we've talked a lot about the sources and the reasoning for migration, and so now there's the second half of the equation that I think is very important that we look at. So there, I'm talking about two parallel studies that we've been doing at Urban Institute. One is regarding quantifying uh, migration and migration patterns globally as well as in the U.S., and then the other is what are the contexts in which individuals are moving to. So let's start off fairly quickly with just reviewing the numbers. Uh, my colleague already introduced some of these numbers. Uh, these are the 2017 displacement. We were just um, updated uh, a few weeks ago for the 2018 disasters. But of the 30.6 internally displaced folks globally, 18.8 came from disaster, uh, were caused by disaster, 18, and of that, 18 million were weather-related re disasters. So we're looking at, in 2017, a proportion of about 59% of internally displaced people globally were uh, caused by weather-related disasters. The update in 2018, there are 20.8 million globally displaced, 17.2 to disasters, and of that, 16.1 were weather-related disasters. So that's now up to 77%. So obviously these are just two points in time, but we see a consistent pattern that weather causes displacement. Um, both internally and globally. So where are folks going to? So again, these are the internal displacement numbers, but we did an overlay of just economic development level. So we're looking at very similar patterns. 2017, China and India, granted by the size of their populations, were the leading, but there are also huge sources in the Caribbean and Central uh, America, West and Eastern, uh, the Cape uh, Africa, and uh, Southeast Asia and the Pacific Islands. In 2018, the latest numbers, the Philippines have surpassed China. 3.8 million uh, uh, were internally displaced in the Philippines compared to China's 3.7 million. Just for some comparison's sake, in 2017, uh, 1.7 million were displaced in the U.S., um, in 2018, 1.2 million. So we're seeing um, uh, similarities, not just sort of globally in terms of weather-related patterns, but certainly these are ex exacerbated by the level of economic development in these countries. So where are they going to? Right. Um, so we're seeing it combinations of the internal displacement that are occurring within countries. And then when you look at those places, the cities in which they go to tend to be the major coastal, the Lagoses of the world, the Shanghais, the Mumbais of the world, where there is a lot of economic development that are places that are just as vulnerable to um, uh, weather-related incidences as the rural places that people may be moving to. But there are also increasing new routes. So there are we have, again, I'm very happy to have been preceded by somebody who said, who sort of break down this idea of traditional migration routes of the global south to the global north, when in reality now we're seeing a different pattern of people from 
the Caribbean and Central America, moving to Mexico, from uh, uh, the, uh, the South American highlands, moving to Argentina. So these sort of regional shifts of power, that uh, shifts of migration routes that, are, that sort of break that uh, traditional overlay. And they're, again, they're moving from vulnerability to another vulnerability. So let's look a little bit beyond numbers. Now I'm going to go back just down into the U.S. We've been looking at three cases, not coincidentally, matching the exact same cases I think Alice <laughs> discussed earlier, and so I'd like to give a little more nuance to those as well. So the first was the New Orleans who moved to Houston after Hurricane Katrina. And let's look at these contexts. New Orleans at the time, 2005, at the time of Hurricane Katrina was 67% African American. Houston was 12.1% African American. Houston was also wealthier by about 15 percentage points compared to New Orleans. We're also looking at the case of Puerto Ricans who moved to Orlando in particular. Puerto Rico, the island being 99% Hispanic population, Orlando at the, in 2017 being 31% Hispanic. Um, Orlando being clearly wealthier. The average income in uh, Orange County in Orlando compared to the average income of the entire island of Puerto Rico what, is two and a half times higher. The last case we're looking at is Jean, is Jean Charles, Louisiana, that has been mentioned in other panels uh, before. Predominantly native community, um, uh, moving to Shriver, Terrebonne Parish, uh, a little further north, where um, the native population is 1.4%, and the wealth, uh, the average income is 2.3 times what it was, what is Jean Charles is. So these are three different cases at three different points in time, right? Katrina happened in 2005, Sandy two, um, uh, six years later, seven years, six years, seven years later. And um, Isla Sean Charles is currently during, going through the relocation process. So there are people who are moving to places very much unlike their own demographically. So let's take beyond the numbers. What happens during that during that movement process, during the point of movement and soon after that. So looking at media reports, social, uh, um, uh, other uh, uh, community-wide surveys, and administrative documents from these jurisdictions, we're starting to see some other very interesting patterns. Let's look at Houston in particular and the post-Katrina environment. Mayor White has spent an inordinate amount of time doing a very a huge welcome mat to the New Orleans who are moving to Houston. Um, putting op-eds in the local Houston newspapers, mentioning, noting that how welcoming, how welcoming the community was. And there were several, for about a year after the fact, there were several commentaries around the uber hospitality of, uh, New Orleans, of Houstonians for the New Orleanians. Um, the, uh, uh, a Rice study, Rice University's housing area survey, which they do every year, noted that 85% of the population of Houston had either volunteered in, for Katrina victims or had donated money to Katrina victims. So this was known as the best of Houston, welcoming its neighbors. So what happened soon after that? Not so soon after that, about a year and a half after that. So there's a conflict of two different things that are occurring. One is the federal aid that goes to FEMA that is funneled through um, the local jurisdictions starts drying up. That's about a year and a half into the, into the scenario. There are also then uh, the increasing realization that what was perceived as temporary migration, temporary relocation, has become permanent. So with those that combination of changes, there uh, are different headlines that we start seeing in the newspapers. Shifting of Houston's identity. Houstonians convinced that the New Orleanians had brought crime with them and had increased the crime rates in, in Houston because of that. I'm going to quote a hearing that was held in 2011, five years after the fact. Um, uh, regarding sort of the services and uh, public provision of ongoing aid to the New Orleanian uh, migrants. Um, the hearing was mostly white, mostly affluent crowd of 1,700, um, bound to drive, and this is from an op-ed that was written the day after, bound to drive the mostly poor, mostly black newcomers, not just out of their neighborhoods, but out of their town. In this desire, they were not alone. So the same survey I mentioned before, the Houston area survey that Rice conducts every year, by 2011 noted that 74% 74, 74 of the residents that were pulled now thought that helping the evacuees had put a considerable strain on the community. 66% believed evacuees were responsible for major increase in violent crime, and 47% believed the city would be worse off if most of the evacuees decided to continue to stay put. There was an open mic 
at this event. And those of you familiar with open mics knows what happened, knows the kind of comments that are made. Speakers demanded an end to, and I quote, perpetual entitlements for, and I also quote, note the language, Katrina illegal immigrants. As White was recommending, Mayor White was recommending more neighborhood watch groups to deal with perceptions of crime and promising additional police cadet classes, et cetera. Um, several people piped up, shoot them. That's how you get rid of the problem. A woman said, to thunderous applause, we want the New Orleans residents to go home. The city's mayor, meaning New Orleans mayor at the time, Ray Nagin, uh, should send the bus and we'll pay for it. So these are the kinds of things that occur in the longer term. Once per what proceeds as temporary relocation becomes permanent relocation. Let's talk about another example that we're witnessing. So this is the Orlando case, the Puerto Ricans who moved to Orlando. Same similar story. In the short term, there's a lot of, there's a, there's a rolling out of the welcome mats. Orlando actually became a model um, in many other cities during the 2017 disaster season, um, uh, disaster, uh, series of disasters of how to welcome them, how to welcome immigrants, uh, migrants, climate, weather, disaster related migrants. Um, Rick Scott, uh, former governor, now senator, opened up several, uh, opening centers, including those directly in the airport. As Puerto Ricans came off the planes, they were greeted with several service, so, social service agents, um, noting where they can get housing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Florida, the state of Florida even requested and received a one of its kind CWGDR, um, the HUD's uh, Community Development Block Grant for Disaster Recovery Fund as a receiving community. This is rare. Uh, uh, FEMA all obviously gives receiving communities some assistance, but for it to be a disaster recovery assistance, it tends to be in situ where the disaster occurred. So this is a, a chunk of change went over to Florida because of this. So now, a year and a half later, what are we seeing? Similar stories um, that are just starting to rise out from media reports. A survey done by colleagues at the um, University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine comparing, looking at Puerto Ricans who moved to Orlando versus those who moved to Miami noted that those in uh, Orlando have had a harder time finding jobs, housing, and transportation. And generally, quote, they felt less welcome than those who moved to Miami and surrounding areas. So why Miami is somehow experiencing an ongoing sort of welcome uh, sense of welcoming among the migrants is uh, yet to be seen. Uh, we're still tracking this as we will be tracking the Ile de Jean Charles folks. But ultimately, um, looking at these um, sort of uh, repeat, and we're also sort of interested in looking at these repeat receivers. For example, does that affect sort of the quality of um, the, the shortness the, of the early onset welcome if somebody continuously receives, if there's a continuing migration pattern within these places? Um, but in either case, some of these early patterns are enough to introduce some concern as we talk about managed retreat and if it doesn't include that, that other half, the second half of the migration equation, which is where people go to. And that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. the panelists come on up and um, this was a great set of papers so I hope you're all um, ready with some questions I have a one sort of primer question uh, or actually I have a couple if, if the conversation doesn't get going but um, come on have a seat and um, so I was going to start with you Emma I thought um, and it actually relates to you as well Carlos I guess one of the things I've observed is that um, um, Sometimes it's the poorest communities that have the most welcoming attitude towards their neighbors. And it's this notion that, you know, you don't have much to begin with and uh, you see someone in need and you welcome them in. And I wonder if there are any examples of um, states uh, that are, are um, essentially regional compacts among countries that have very disparate levels of development uh, or examples of, um, you know, wealthier cities or communities saying, hey, we have more than enough to share and <laughs> we're welcoming people in because they're, uh, they're in need. So maybe if each of you could you know, touch on that and then we'll keep going with some audience interaction. Hi, um, is this on? Can you all hear me? Great. Um, so that's a really good question, Alex, and part of um, why I think the Caribbean 
agreements work is because there are similar levels of economic development, um, which I mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry, here. Hi, is that, is that on? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's part economic, similar levels of economic development definitely help um, in these agreements actually being feasible. The Pacific, um, where New Zealand and Australia are sitting next to Palau um, and Kiribati, for example, does not have a framework like this. Um, and I would conjecture, I, I don't have the data, but I would conjecture that that's because of disparate levels of economic development. That being said, there are cases where more developed, wealthier countries accept migrants in for labor schemes, often to fill labor gaps. Um, and so that's one context where we are seeing movement from poorer nations or less developed nations to, to more developed ones. Um, just to add to that, Can people hear me? I'll speak loud enough so you can hear me. Oh, I just have to press the button. Okay. <clears throat> Is it, is it on? Okay. Um, there are actually cases in the U.S. of this. Uh, CPS was provided to Central Americans in the 1980s after Hurricane Mitch. It's not that long ago that we had a um, much more welcoming migration um, policy in the United States. I'm also curious about, and I wanted to maybe ask my colleague about this. I mean, we've heard um, in, in some cases there are, when you're talking about at the municipal level or intra-state level, I mean, there have been cases in Katrina, um, uh, migrants from New Orleans, obviously when Houston was the biggest uh, receiver community, but there was also Baton Rouge, a similar state, with relative, not quite the same uh, demographic background, but at least there's, a, there's a, in many of the media reports that you'll see in the anecdotal evidence is regarding their perceived similarities, like New Houstonians said, well, we're Gulf people too, we're Bayou people as well, and in Baton Rouge, they're, well, we're Louisianans as well. There's a lot of religious uh, language that goes on in a lot of this. Orlando was clearly a site that where there was a large Puerto Rican community to begin with. The majority of the Latino population in Orlando was Puerto Rican. Um, so, so there was sort of this perception that we're helping our own um, in that process. When you look globally, though, I've been kind of intrigued by cases like New Zealand that have very loose agreements with um, the Pacific Island nations because of their Polynesian, the similar Polynesian background, the Maori saying that we're willing to support. I'm not, I have, I've only read some of the documentation around the New Zealand, the Kiwi, their formal agreements with some of the Pacific Island nation states, but I think maybe they follow along similar patterns as you were discussing about. But I, I, not, I don't think it's directly free a flow of migrants, but at least a commitment or a promise. So we have cases, both domestically and globally, of this being a potential um, opportunity to think logically and humanely about how we deal with people. Great. So we're, we're going to open it up now to uh, there's a hand in the back. So I see Deborah Ball. take that up? <laughs> I guess what you're talking about is within a country, state to state or province to province agreements. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Maybe in the U.S. we could talk about, I mean, in 
This happens in larger states, intra-county emergency management um, uh, agreements, which happen sort of are one-offs that people agree, well, we'll take a certain number of your uh, residents in a, and we'll, we'll assist you in emergency relief and response and we'll take people for how, you know, temporary housing and that sort of thing. It's quite common to have those inter-jurisdictional agreements. I think, I think that happens in most states and for people here from state and local uh, government, they'd be good for you to talk up. But those kinds of things happen. The thing is when it happens, when the relocation is beyond temporary is when things get funny. Okay, we've got a couple more hands here, Lex. Uh, I have a question for um, Francis as well. Um, I confess I wasn't aware of these regional free movement agreements. Uh, beyond an admirable form of solidarity, I'm wondering whether uh, self-interest may be playing a role uh, in the sense that two neighboring countries may be hit by one hurricane and they don't know which one is going to be hit. Is there any evidence that that might be playing a role? Thanks for this that question. Um, so. These these agreements um, were developed before climate change became a reality that we talk about and acknowledge. So I, I don't think um, we could say that participation in these agreements is linked to wanting to have a destination country for climate migrants. Um, that being said, I think there are benefits to countries for participating in these. Um, for example, for small island developing states that have small populations and small economies, by joining economies um, and labor flows, it, it increases economic development regionally across all islands, so there are some benefits. Um, and I, I think in terms of incentivizing receiving countries and communities and in, in taking in climate migrants, actually these economic development benefits are one argument that can be used. Um, but I, I don't know, I would frame it as self-interest. Um, that just might be a perspective thing, but there definitely are benefits and incentives to both receiving and sending communities. Did I see a hand over here? Um, so I was gonna actually, I don't know if my mic is working, hopefully. Uh, for Susan, um, one of the things that you, um, you know, you mentioned you will look at local migration, say, out of the immediate coastal zone, but one of the things that I've observed in a number of countries that do have high-risk housing areas that tend to be for poor populations, people are reluctant to leave those high-risk areas because they have high, uh, very good access to jobs and to opportunities in the, either the business district or the industrial areas that they work in. So is that something that's common in Lagos as well? Oh yes, that's the case in the coastal areas of Lagos where a lot of the economic activity happens by the coast, a lot of the businesses happens by the coast. And so people live there, but they can't afford to live in the well-developed structures. And so you find a lot of slum settlements in these areas. You have the elites living side by side by the urban poor as well. And so yeah, it's a, it's a huge uh, thing to look at because these flooding events have been occurring rapidly, but people refuse to move from those areas. And so it will be interesting to see how as these events become more frequent and more intense and, you know, the loss of lives, loss of pro property, how, for example, they might maybe um, be willing to be supported by government assistance projects to move them into retreat them but into like better um, housing um, structures but still living within Lagos because of the economic opportunities that they have. They probably can't even consider moving further away because they don't have the income, they don't have the ties to be able to make those longer distance movement decisions. Great. Um one other last observation I'll make, um, not seeing any other hands uh, before we move to the poster session and the coffee break in a moment, um, is just that it, uh, in relation to the Rohingya crisis and a number of others um, that are occurring globally and potentially the, you know, potential uptick in the number of people who may be displaced for short-term periods from coastal zones, we are going to have to think about, especially in these least developed country contexts, of where people are going and whether or not those areas are safe or not from climate hazards. It's the same basic question as 
you know, uh, if people are moving out of the flying pan into the fire in certain parts of the world by moving to adjacent urban areas that are just as exposed. So I think those kinds of discussions are going to be much more at the fore. But let's give a final round of applause to our panelists. My name is Justin Kozak. I have the distinct pleasure of being the MC of this session. Uh, I will say I think this is going to be the most important session of the day. It's on government planning. Undoubtedly, it will be so. Uh, if you were at the panel last night, uh, there were a few questions about government planning. And there clearly was no consensus on the stage. You saw close to active disagreement uh, as other people were answering. Um, so that I think this is a big unanswered question. Uh, so I'm hoping we get uh, some insights um, as a geographer by training. Everything's about context, and so seeing what different government plans and approaches work in different places is always very interesting to me, and I think it can shed light on a lot of the questions that are being asked at this conference. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce Francis Bowie from CDM Smith. Thank you, Justin. Um, so I'll just say, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> um, I'll just crack the joke already, which is I'm, I'm a coastal and water resources engineer, and I'll just outright with the irony, which is my last name is Bowie. Um, <laughs> and I uh, just wanted to really take a qu quick poll. This is, again, being back in the classroom here. Um, who here read the article in the New York Times that was published yesterday about which cities to save? Okay, great. Um, who here has heard of FEMA's risk rating 2.0? Okay, great. And who here has also heard of or learned about the Disaster Recovery Reform Act of 2018? Awesome. And uh, BRIC, which is the Building Resilient uh, Infrastructure in Communities. Right, okay. So I, I will be generally speaking about those topics um, and just making sure everyone's aware of what's going on. Um, I'm here just because I've, I work in the consulting business. I've worked for FEMA in different um, capacities. I've been the one that's walked the shorelines. I've been the one that has created the maps. I've been the one that's been deployed um, after Hurricane Sandy. I've been the one that's been there immediately after the storm as part of a mitigation assessment team. And this is really me sharing information about the experiences that I've had and, and the processes in which FEMA has been trying to push um, that change. Um, understandably, there's a lot of things that are going on in terms of limitations. Um, but this is, again, just a, a conversation that I wanted to have with you about what FEMA is trying to do to, to get that nation, our nation, ready for, um, you know, that next big disaster. So again, just an, a general overview, background. Uh, you know, again, I, I think I'm speaking to the course here, which is there's uh, some discussion about what FEMA does in terms of their hazard mitigation programs. Um, FEMA also has other technical assistance programs that are there to help communities. Um, and, you know, the other thing I'll just generally speak about is my work uh, as part of the FEMA mitigation assessment team. So FEMA has a strategic plan, build a culture of preparedness. And, and what does that actually mean? That means providing the tools and the data that's out there to help communities um, build that culture of preparedness, make those decisions ahead of time before disaster actually happens. The next thing that FEMA wants to do is to ready the nation for catastrophic disasters, really trying to work with partners across all levels. And what we've heard today and, and yesterday as well, and I'm, what I'm assuming we're going to be hearing again and again, especially within this session that basically goes from government governance, um, federal governance, all the way down to the community or municipal, municipality level, is to be proactive, is to reach out and to have a program where the federal government is supporting it, the state is managing it, and it's really driven by proactive communities and executed by those localities. And, of course, I think one other major concept about this whole, you know, um, FEMA system is that it's really complex. And so they are really working hard, and we as the consultants and contractors are working hard to try to reduce the complexity of FEMA as we go forward. But this conference is really about managed retreat, or maybe it's mismanaged retreat. 
Um, to some degree, uh, decisions are made because people want to go back to exactly how it was before. There's economic pressure to shorten that recovery time. So you can see here three examples of, of recent disasters, one in which Governor Christie says, I will be in Belmar immediately that next Memorial Day. That puts that level of Jersey strong out there instead of the Jersey smart of how should we, re we be rebuilding. And then the next middle one is about Hurricane Michael, about Panama City, Mexico Beach, how they struggled to recover from these large storms. You know, they're still going through this process of, of understanding. And while I was just down there a couple of months ago, you know, there's still debris um, piles everywhere. Same with North, North Carolina um, after Hurricane Florence, which is they're, they're just, they're taking their time to spend the money, but the media and others see it as they're struggling, right? They're, they're holding on. They're not necessarily um, making the progress that is expected. And what can we do? What can, what can the government do? What can local communities do? Which is plan for the worst, hope for the best. Um, to some degree, uh, what FEMA has been trying to do and has been pushing is this element of hazard mitigation planning. And we all know that in order for that FEMA funding to be available, hazard mitigation plan has to be in, in place. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other ha plans that are out there the community has to have, right? The community has to think about wastewater management, stormwater, risk communication, and capital improvement plans. They, those can be all um, sewn together with this element of hazard mitigation, how it can be um, both supported from local, state, federal government bonds in terms of financial support, but having those ideas that are then promulgated through each of those different panels, having that information ahead of time, setting those expectations ahead of time, allows for easier buy-in when the buyout has to happen. Again, I think speaking to a lot of people who know about what's going on, FEMA does support this idea of retreat. They have different programs that are going on right now that fund acquisitions and buyouts. Um, so this is a really short pre-disaster versus post-disaster easy split of different programs. It's, it's not as easy as I know that I, I'm making it um, show up here. Um, there's a pre-disaster mitigation program, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, which again allots an annual budget every year to support the acquisition and um, either demolition or relocation of specific properties. In the post-disaster environment, there's hazard mit mitigation grant program and public assistance. And again, there are limitations within the Stafford Act of what can be and cannot be funded as part of those programs. For the pre-disaster mitigation program, which is slowly transitioning towards what my next slide will be talking about, is that there, there's funding that's out there. Um, I've gone through and I've seen a lot of those grant applications that have, have um, been submitted as part of this program. It covers all 50 states and territories. I think last year was $235 million. The year before that was 220 And that's about the... That's about the, the trend in which they're moving towards. And it does provide um, funding towards different types of acquisitions and demolitions, other types of projects as, as well. It's not just related to just funding. And it, a lot of times there's a lot of um, pain that goes through having to fill out the application, getting all the paperwork in there, as well as determining whether or not it's cost effective using the benefit cost analysis tool. Um, one thing that FEMA has tried to do to make it easier is to have something called predetermined benefits. So they had done, gone through a real estate analysis and looked at whether or not it was cost effective and they decided upon, based on a national average, um, the cost of acquisition is less than $276,000 and it's, that structures within the special flood hazard area, then no other detailed analysis is needed. So with that type of information, a community can go and target a specific neighborhood that's um, within the special flood hazard area and have that discussion with the local leaders or with the homeowners about what is possible, what, whether or not you know, they, they need to go and, and get through that process of acquisition. 
again, two examples, um, press releases of, of awards that happened to two different locations. Understandably, coastal properties, as we've heard about in California and even on the East Coast, are really expensive. Um, and that comes, you know, that's just a hard decision that has to be made. Um, again, just based on what can, what FEMA can do in terms of what is cost effective is, um, is a, an important conversation to have. As I had mentioned, and as we had our hands raised before, um, FEMA is moving towards a different terminology, uh, using similar concepts of what uh, FEMA can do to encourage increases in mitigation. I think there was a moonshot uh, FEMA had, had promulgated saying that they wanted to increase mitigation spending four, by four times in, by 2022. And this DRRA Act that was passed um, helps to do that. It has 50 or so different uh, amendments to the Stafford Act that help to increase the ability for FEMA to provide that type of mitigation um, support. So there's a, now a 6% set aside funding mechanism for whenever there is a disaster for um, a community to be able to, pro, to uh, request and ask for and apply for a grant for this type of funding. There's informational webinars. Um, there's actually one like right now, unfortunately. Um, there, uh, FEMA is, is really looking for feedback. Um, they've had three, today's the third, I think there's one next week of four webinars that will discuss more broadly what BRIC, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, are and um, you know, the different elements associated with that. So um, in addition to having these webinars, there's also an opportunity for communities and stakeholders to provide comments. So if there needs to be uh, an easier way for retreat to be handled by FEMA or if there's other benefits that should be considered as part of that, um, they have a they use idea scale, which is a, a comment uh, compendium type of interactive thing. Um, so I. I would suggest and encourage everyone to go um, learn about BRIC, to learn more about what FEMA is trying and moving towards, as well as providing comments and feedbacks to that. As I'm talking about the, the grant application side of it, there are other technical assistance information that's out there for communities um, to help in determining what are the requirements that FEMA is asking for in terms of acquisition, demolition, acquisition, and relocation. These are two job aids that are available, um, that are publicly available, that are basically what FEMA reviewers are looking for when they're doing their environmental planning and historic preservation. I'm not saying that this is like the exact thing that everyone needs to do, but I feel like it's a really great checklist to help communities think about what else they, they ought to do or you know the information that they're trying to compile. And a lot of times it's the data that's really driving some of the decisions that are being made. As I had previously mentioned, um, I was also a part of the FEMA mitigation assessment team that visited um, parts of Florida uh, after Hurricane Irma as well as after Hurricane Michael. And as you can see here, you know, that this is a forced almost retreat um, to some degree. Um, large parts of Mexico Beach uh, were severely impacted um, when we had gone there to visit. Um, the FEMA mitigation assessment team is, is really through the FEMA building science branch. Um, where a team of sub subject matter experts from structural engineers to building code experts um, to coastal engineers go to a location, understand what happened during the severe events, looked at what building damage, failure and successes happened. Have, and we have conversations with the engineers and officials at that location to get a better understanding of you know, what, what happened and, and what they're moving towards. And what we had heard, which was again a kind of an interesting element to all of this, is that um, there are communities now that are no longer uh, building to just the 1%, right? That is the minimum standard. There are communities now that are looking at the 0.2% as the minimum standard. Um, they want to increase freeboard, they want to increase the design flood elevation as part of that. Um, and my talk tomorrow is about a local community in Massachusetts 
just a little plug out there if anyone wants to come see that one as well. Um, but again, this is the type of conversation that we're having with communities. This is the type of support that FEMA wants to hear about what other communities are doing. Uh, because really, when it comes down to it, codes and regulations kind of set the standard for what FEMA can build back towards. Um, the communities need to define what those standards are in order for FEMA to figure out, well, you know, this is what that new standard is going to be. This is what the funding is going to be to replace something at, at that accepted code or standard. In addition, um, the mitigation assessment team has a series of reports. Really, it's focused, um, a lot of them are, are focused on building science issues, um, but there's certainly a lot of commentary in there as well about floodplain management, about codes and regulations, about standards, um, about pushing the, the evaluation of risk and vulnerability. Um, and so I just wanted to put out that, you know, in the past couple of years, we've had to do a lot of them um, because of just the impacts and severities of the different storms impacting different areas. And I'll say that there's a lot that's been learned um, over the past couple of years, too. So I would certainly also recommend um, anyone who's interested in, in these types of materials to go and, and take a look at that as well. Um, with that, those, I, I wanted to give a shout out to my co-authors, which are John and Gargiola and Manny Perotin. Um, I wanted to remind you about the, the mitigation minute. And um, I did have a conversation with some of um, my, my presenters earlier on today. And um, I wanted to leave you with a limerick. Um, this is not my limerick. Um, this is a limerick from my friend and your mentor, Chris Jones, who is a limerick master. And we were having a couple of conversations about sea level rise and managed retreat, et cetera. Um, so I will pick, OK, I'll pick this one. Retreat is a third rail topic where opinions are rather myopic. You should abandon and leave versus you are so naive. Uncle Sam, can you be philanthropic? <laughs> Thank you. Up next, we have Carolyn Frioli. All right, all right, I'm going home. Uh, Rebecca Newell from the New York State Department of State and Jane Brogan from the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. And I wish I had a cool limerick. I feel like that should be all of our homework <laughs> to come tomorrow with an awesome limerick. <laughs> anyway, so my name is Carolyn Frioli. I work for the New York Department of State's Office of Planning, Development, and Community Infrastructure. I'm joined today by my co-presenters, Rebecca Newell of Department of State and Jane Brogan of the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. So today we're going to be talking to you about classifying risks to help prioritize recovery and resilience management strategies. So an overview of our presentation today, um, I'll start by talking about the Department of State's risk assessment process, then I'll pass it over to Rebecca to talk about our DOS risk area maps and applications and planning. And then Jane will talk about the Gozer buyout and acquisition program, as well as highlight a case study of a successful buyout program in Staten Island. So our office, we increase the resilience and sustainable growth of New York communities, and we advance intentional and strategic planning, development, and protection of New York's land and water resources at the community, state, and regional level. So our office is home to New York's Coastal Management Program. We also have the local waterfront revitalization program, as well as the Brownfields program. So the focus of the presentation today is really on development of risk area maps and how those were applied to help inform the location of a buyout program. However, our risk area maps actually fold into a DOS risk assessment process in which community assets are identified and then a risk score is calculated for each asset based on factors related to risk. So DOS uses an equation for risk that includes three equally weighted factors. We have our hazard, that is the magnitude and likelihood of a future storm event. So for example, the one in 100 year flood event. We have our exposure. Those are local landscape characteristics that tend to either increase or decrease storm effects. So for example, the presence or absence of things like dunes and beaches. 
And finally, vulnerability. That's the capacity of an asset or a system to return to service after a storm event. So for example, say a small business is impacted by a storm, can it open its doors, be operational within a day or two, or does it take a couple of weeks to months to become fully operational? So these three factors are scored for each asset and they're multiplied across to produce a risk score. So the risk equation is used as part of a risk assessment process in which community assets are identified. So for example, things important to the community, critical infrastructure, schools, hospitals, neighborhoods, other kinds of cultural and natural resources. Then the risk equation is applied and a quantitative risk score is calculated for each asset using a risk assessment tool. So the higher the risk score, the greater level of risk. Qualitative factors are also considered as part of this process. So again, these are things that don't necessarily relate to the risk score, the quantitative score, but they're really helpful for context setting, also for helping to determine prioritization. Finally, management strategies are developed and prioritized. So for a community that has a number of at-risk assets, you know, limited budget, this process can really help to kind of narrow down where do you want to focus your resources. So namely those assets with high risk scores, high community value, for example. So the risk area maps, as I mentioned, fold into our risk assessment process and they're used as part of the exposure score. Um, the risk assessment maps that Rebecca is going to be discussing, they're a really helpful visual resource, communication resource. They can be folded into other kinds of planning or assessment efforts. So I just included an example just as a preview of uh, one of our risk areas and identified um, community assets. And I'll pass it over to Rebecca. So all day I've been uh, looking at everybody up here and saying, are they going to be able to see me over the podium? So I'm glad to know that uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, we developed the risk assessment maps as a visual tool to enable people to kind of have a simple way of um, visualizing risk on the landscape and prioritize um, actions that would help to make their communities more resilient. And in doing this, um, we worked with NOAA to identify what data sets were available um, you know, for our entire area for communities to use. And you can see them on the slide here. We had um, just a simple bathtub inundation showing uh, what three feet of sea level rise might look like on the landscape. And uh, we had the FEMA national flood insurance maps to represent floodplain areas uh, that are likely to be inundated by those intense storm events. And it also helped inform our levels of classifying risk by providing kind of a framework for magnitude and likelihood that people were somewhat familiar with. Um, we used the National Weather Service slosh model, which estimates storm surge heights and expected inundation extent from hurricanes. And then unlike those kind of severe storm events, we also incorporated um, NOAA's shallow coastal flooding advisory areas to really look at, in addition to those major storm events, where we see areas of localized kind of nuisance flooding that's occurring on those sunny days outside of extreme storm events, but more from ordinary rain events that coincide with a very spring high tide. Lastly, we had our uh, dynamic natural shoreline features that we wanted to look, look at, which are uh, features in the landscape, such as beaches, dunes, and bluffs that Carolyn mentioned that fold into that risk assessment landscape attribute part of the tool uh, that are also susceptible to erosion events and increased risks from changing future conditions. So all of this data that I mentioned was readily available for people to be able to visualize different risks on the landscape, but we felt that there was really no one tool that helped people visualize those kinds of cumulative risks in a very simple and understandable way. So uh, for example, what might those areas of nuisance flood expand to and what might they look like given three feet of sea level rise instead of our current mean high water conditions? And what you see here is an example of our mapped risk zones, red being extreme, orange being high, yellow being moderate. And what does that mean, right? So our extreme risk zone are those areas that we would expect to um, experience flooding within a 20 year time frame. So we used um, FEMA's V-Zone, which incorporated areas that we can expect to be inundated from storm-induced waves and risks associated with them. Three feet of sea level rise are kind of those, those moderate projections. 
shallow coastal flood areas and our dynamic natural shoreline feature areas. High a likelihood and a magnitude on the order and frequency of FEMA's 100-year storm event. So we have the A zone or the 100-year flood. We also included a projection of what the uh, NOAA shallow coastal flooding might look like with three feet of sea level rise. And again, all of this was just done with a very simple bathtub approach. And uh, moderate, so lower frequency or projected to occur with uh, greater frequency given changing future conditions. So the slash category three hurricane, 100-year storm plus a visualization of that with three feet of sea level rise. So you can see kind of sea level rise is, is woven through as one of the major risks along our downstate area of New York coast. So since we released the risk assessment tool and mapping for our downstate areas in 2012, we've um, found that it's been flexible enough to be used by communities for local planning initiatives, as well as by state agencies, such as um, New York State Parks to assess the relative vulnerability of coastal park infrastructure and natural resources. We're currently working on a DGIS for a potential transfer of development rights program that would look at using the extreme and high risk zones to consider their use for identifying sending areas. And um, after completion of the coastal risk areas for our downstate, we also recognize the need to adapt this for areas elsewhere in the state that we work with. So, we expanded it and included Lake Ontario. The updated Lake Ontario tool and maps are currently um, being used, not really currently, but will be very shortly with the governor's Lake Ontario Resilience and Economic Development Initiative to identify critical and at-risk assets um, and help prioritize projects to rebuild and improve resiliency in the Lake Ontario region. And Jane is here to talk about our New York Rising buyout program and kind of how we worked together and expand on that, which had an application of our risk areas. Thank you. So coming just a year after Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee, Superstorm Sandy caused unprecedented damage to New York. And in early 2013, HUD provided New York State with about $4.6 billion from their Community Development Block Grant Disaster Recovery Funding. And GOZO was created in June 2013 in order to manage that funding for the state. And we carry out five main programs, housing, small business, infrastructure, community reconstruction, and our Rebuild by Design projects. All projects are striking a balance between urgent action and long-term strategic planning. While we developed a single family housing program to fund repair, reconstruction, and elevations, we also understood that rebuilding was not always the wisest, safest, or most practical solution for every neighborhood. The BIO program purchases properties from interested homeowners within targeted areas of the floodplain and permanently returns them to nature, demolishing any structures that once stood and maintaining the properties as open space. In this process, we establish a natural coastal buffer that will protect communities more inland. The program operates in three select neighborhoods of Staten Island, as well as sections of Long Island and one community, riverine community in upstate New York. To date, we have purchased over 700 properties for more than $270 million and completed about 93% of demolitions. The program utilized the DOS risk assessment Carolyn and Rebecca just talked about. Of the three categories of risk identified by DOS's analysis, the extreme and high-risk areas were considered in the creation of the buyout program. The program also took into account other criteria. We looked at if there was a history of flooding and or damage from extreme weather events, if local and county officials were interested and understood the benefits of a buyout program, and if the majority of the property owners in that area had voiced an interest in a buyout area. An example of one of our most successful buyout areas is the Oakwood Beach section of Staten Island, where we have purchased 307 parcels, which totals 25 and a half acres of land. The first map on this slide shows the Oakwood Beach buyout area with the parcels bought out by the by Gozer's program overlaid on DOS's risk area map. The second map shows the Sandy inundation area for that same area. Initially developed as a vacation community in the 1920s, Oakwood Beach was transformed into more permanent housing when after World War II, its bungalows were winterized to accommodate returning soldiers. As human development moved into the community's wetlands, so did the Phragmites, an invasive reed species. 
Over time, the plant steadily crowded out native wetland vegetation. Even before Sandy, Oakwood Beach residents had experienced severe flooding. There were no strangers to the idea of a government-led buyout, and it was for this reason that the community was so quick to express an interest in our program. Today, the parcels purchased have been demolished and the land graded and reseeded with native plants. Nature is making a return to the area as native flora and fauna return. As you can see from this map, returning the Oakwood Beach buyout area to natural green space creates a continuation of an existing natural barrier along the shoreline. Since Gozer is temporary, having to spend our federal grant by September 2022, we are not a suitable long-term land steward for our buyout areas. Recognizing this fact, we have been in discussions with city and state agencies and other organizations to think about the long-term future needs of these parcels. In Oakwood Beach, some properties have been tra transferred to a veterans association, and others will be transferred to New York City for a seawall project. For others, Gozer is still actively seeking and talking to landowners for stewards. The work done in Oakwood Beach and the other bio areas, first identifying risk and then implementing a program will make New York State communities better protected. Thank you for having us. And if you have any questions or want additional information, that's our contact information there. It's definitely an important thing to think about, right? We were able to develop Gozer's buyout programs because of the federal funding that we received. And um, we had identified the risk. I don't think we could have carried out so many of the properties that we purchased in, until we got the federal funding. Um, and it does change, it changes the community and that's also part of the conversation when you layer on the risk to the tax rolls and the municipal community. So it is definitely something that needs to be factored when thinking about how successful a buyout program can be. Um, but right now, that's why so many of the buyout programs are federally funded and dependent on federal aid in order to be carried out. And then if you can Definitely, and I didn't talk about it here, but the buyout program is just one area. We have an acquisition program, too, that we purchase homes and people who are not interested in staying in high-risk areas, but they are less prone to repetitive flooding. And then they are auctioned and sold for um, more resilient redevelopment. So I think, you know, especially in the sandy inundation areas, the Staten Island and Long Island, where the population is so condensed, you can't have a buyout program everywhere along the coastline because there's no place for anyone to move. So you have to figure out where the areas are best for buyouts and where areas are best for other um, interventions, resilient interventions, and how they go together and tie in together. We are, so it goes there, we have a full research team and we are expanding. We are willing, they are all here today too willing to partner and we have a lot of data um, and we're doing a lot of work on this now, especially as our programs are starting to close, looking to see um, the effectiveness of them and, and how they're looking at, you know, in five years, 10 years and everything. Since it seems like you're looking for long-term owners of the land. 
So one of the requirements of our federal funding is that we lose access to it in September 2022. So the way that federal disaster recovery, especially on the HUD side of things is, is it's very choice limiting in how we spend it. So our, our biggest spender is single family homeowner repair, reconstruction and elevation. So people who didn't, that's over $2 billion alone of our portfolio. We have a small business program, we have an infrastructure program, and we have a program called our Community Reconstruction Program, where around the states we worked with local communities and developed smaller resiliency-based community programs that we're now implementing too. So that's where the other part of our grant went, but that's also one of the issues with kind of the disposition and, and land stewardship of our program is just because the federal money goes away, so we can't put that towards anything beyond September 2022. Thanks. Is El Nazir here? Okay. Uh, we're going to move on. Um, so it's a geographer's dream. We've gone from the federal level to the state level, and now we're going to go to the hyper-local scale with Tyler Harrison from the University of Miami. And continuing with your geologist dream, we're going to have a lot of maps today. So I'm Tyler Harrison, University of Miami. I am here representing my team. I'll show in just a minute. And really trying to think about ways we can change some of the discourses and ways of thinking about this climate adaptation process. So this is a map of South Florida back in 1764. And you can see the geography on there. We've got all kinds of channels going through the keys in ways that you don't see anything like that today, at least as it was envisioned back then. Um, this will be important as we kind of scale down and start looking at much more localized communities and some of the challenges that we might face within them. So my team is a really amazing team. We've got Gina Miranda, who works at the Abbas Center in Public Policy. Sam Perkis is a marine geologist who does a lot of LIDAR mapping. Angela Clark is our librarian who helps us with data sets and information coordination. Joanna Lombard on uh, architecture design type processes. Amy Clement is a climate modeler. And I'm in communication. This picture was taken at a presentation about two weeks ago at the Frost Science Center, and that's us projected onto the planetarium. So hopefully it's not a forecast that retreat is saying we have to go to the stars in the future, um, but rather maybe that we're all stars on our team. Uh, so this project is really, I like this team a lot because it's funded, University of Miami has this cool project called ULINK, which is the University Library for Integrated Knowledge. And it's specifically designed to fund interdisciplinary teams with the goal of bringing people together to take on some of these larger important societal challenges. Hopefully we're doing something that's gonna make a difference that way, but it's, it's been a great project to work on so far. Okay. Our central thesis as we talk about this is really that when we think about decision making and planning about adaptation processes, that we really need to think about the local level to take into account their unique risks, their assets, their values, and the possible courses of action that any given community might have, and recognizing that they're not all the same. Now, is all of Miami at risk? Absolutely. Right? My house is nine feet above sea level. I feel like I could be at a uh, well, confessional here, right? Tyler Harrison, my house is 90 above sea level. Um, <clears throat> but there's definitely places in Miami that are much more at risk than other places for a variety of different reasons. So what I want to just talk a little bit about some of the current scales of action that we see and then move down to a level where we've been working and see if we've got a place where we can bridge and fill in some missing gaps. And we have amazing work going on in Miami. Right? We've got people working at the government level. So ever since we started this, every week we get notifications about all of the meetings taking place around town, the planning processes, the local groups working, the government groups working, and it's just kind of overwhelming in a sense. But at the government level, we tend to be working at the levels of infrastructure at the regional, city, and county level. Right? And when we look at South Florida, we see these three areas, or four areas, West Palm Beach, um, Broward, Miami-Dade, Monroe County, some of the work transcends those areas, but again, it's focused on these broader pictures and infrastructure for the most part. And I know I've got some people from Miami here who work in these areas, so they'll correct me if I get any of this wrong, so I'm not worried about that. At the very local level, we have the NGOs and some amazing groups as well that we work with. The Clio Institute, for example, does all kinds of activism work. Catalyst is out on the ground doing that as well. Now, in between, though, as we look at the things they talk about, this notion of 
infrastructure is really the predominant level at that government level. So the South Florida Regional Climate Compact, these are some of the things they work on, agriculture, energy fuel, natural systems, public policy and advocacy, and so on. And this is one that really transcends those four counties we had up there. Okay. The county level, very similar. You've seen some slides from New York that probably represent this as well, very closely in terms of how we look at it. But that infrastructure and planning kind of process. At the city level, the most recent one's been talking about master stormwater plans. Okay. And when we get down to that very local action level, it's really about action, education, advocacy. But it's really going on to the ground where the communities have connections and working with them. And what we think is that there's some places that are missing in terms of how that work can actually take place. And so what we're looking at as we think about our project is where are the gaps between these local levels of advocacy and these larger levels of infrastructure. And so this map of Miami shows some of the floodplains there, but they're all labeled pretty much the same, AE or AH. It's kind of hard to tell the difference in what exactly that means. All right, so the purple are the, the stronger flood zones at this point in time. And so what we think is we can dive deeper into it and do a data-driven analysis, very granular level mapping, and identifying the highest integrated risk neighborhoods. And by that, I want to go beyond some of the things about the geology that you guys were talking about, the sea level rise and the floodplains and so on, but other factors we've heard about at this conference in terms of what makes a community at risk, education, or not education, income level, rental, and so on and so forth. And by doing that, we can really focus on the individual and community needs and then try and get them to link to policy to maybe come up with some more creative decisions as we go forward. Okay, so some of the challenges we have. Miami-Dade County is what I'm gonna talk about to start with. We have 35 municipalities that are trying to coordinate across, okay? They're often treated as one. Some of these areas, a single zip code might encompass 70 square miles. And that's often where that level of analysis takes place is the zip code level. Right. When we start looking at the topology, topography, sorry, um, what we see is Miami's really got some extremes here. Those of you who don't live in a flat state may laugh at this, but we go from zero to 18 feet, <laughs> okay? That 18 feet makes a big difference when you're talking six, level, six feet level of sea rise, okay. So if you look up in the map, the blue on the edge is South Beach, where most people think about. The red line is the coast, where we've got Brickell, we've got downtown, we've got Coconut Grove, and that red line is 18 feet, six meters above sea level, all right? But when you go inland even, you can see there's a lot of the inland areas where sea level, or level above sea level is about four to five feet, the blue areas, the light brown, five to six feet above sea level, something like that. So all of Miami is at a lot of risk as we go there. Okay, so if we start talking about some other factors that might increase potential risk, we can look at income. Miami has huge income disparities. A recent study said that about 65% of Miami households do not make a living wage. When we think about the ability to adapt, to retreat, to manage those processes, that's a huge problem. The red is the poorest, the purple is the top 1%. Oftentimes we see these communities, but right next to each other, you cross a road and you go from extreme poverty to extreme wealth. Right. When we think about the greenness in the city, we see similar kinds of things. Not only do we have to worry about sea level rise, we have the extreme heat incidents, for example. The green areas also help us with the flooding, the drainage, and so on. And you can see the gray areas are really the central parts of downtown area where we've got a lot of development, but also overlaps with where a lot of the poor residents of the city live. And so some other ways we can think about this notion of the very granular level. And this map is by one of my team members, Sam Perkis, doing some LIDAR mapping of Brickell. Anybody who's been to Miami when you fly in, you see all of the skyscrapers downtown? Brickell is one half of that. It's one of the most densely populated parts. And you can see along the edge where it says Mary Brickell Village, that's about three feet above sea level. Right. And that's where they keep building and building. You drive down there and there's just crane after crane still going up and the building is still taking place. So when you see a lot of the flooding in Miami, it's that area right there. Okay. So for this particular project, we decided we'd focus on one particular spot in Miami and see how deep we could go into the data and see what we could find that might indicate levels of risk. So this is Coconut Grove, and Coconut Grove is a little way south of downtown, a little bit south of Coral Gables, right on the coast. When you look at the lightest white part there, that's the ridge. And that ridge, again, that's about 18 feet. You've got the dark areas or channels that cut through those ridges. And again, that goes down almost to sea level. And then the kind of light areas in the back, again, we're going down in elevation. 
The maps I'm going to show are going to overlay different elements that we consider to uh, contribute to risk and vulnerability and talk about how that might impact some of the decisions and choices people might make. All right. So we start with property value. Uh -huh. And what we see is there's a direct correlation with property value and elevation, a strong positive relationship. So along the ridge, the red, that's the most expensive houses. If you go back to the blue, we're getting back into parts that have the lower elevation. I'm going to flip back one slide. You can see where those dark blue lines are back there. That corresponds to the dark blue in property value. So people who live on the ridges have the most or the highest property value. If we start looking at year of construction, it's not as clear of a trend, but what we can see is that we've got a lot of issues about when some of these houses were built. So there's a lot of areas, if you don't see dark brown, if you see a lot of blue and white, that means they were built probably back in the 50s, and they're not up to current building codes. Anything in the dark brown is going to have built after Hurricane Andrew, and they've really increased the stringency of building codes. But even in any given community there, you can see there's going to be very different needs in terms of how the physical structures in the built environment are going to be impacted. We've heard about rental units and how people who rent are more vulnerable. They're not eligible for a lot of the buyouts that the federal government might have. And again, so the dark blue areas, that's people who own their own homes. The lighter areas, that's the rental. And again, you can see the rental units are in the places that are the lower elevations. And again, we have that negative relationship of rental units and elevation. Rental is in the lower areas. So again, increasing those levels of vulnerability as we go forward. We've heard about minority populations and how they're often disadvantaged as well. And what we can see, one of the reasons we chose Coconut Grove is it's really split in terms not just in economics, but also in this notion of racial diversity. So it was largely founded by Bahamans, Bahamians back in the start of the building of the city. They helped found the city, they helped build the city, and this is where they live, and it's part of their strong identity. But they're in the lowest elevations, they're in the poorest part of the city in this particular region, and that puts them, again, most at risk. So we're just it's kind of stacking these levels of vulnerability in Coconut Grove. And when you go from that red over to the white, oftentimes you go from a house that's very small, very old, no air conditioning, to a condominium that might rent for $5,000 a month for 1,000 square feet, sell for two to $3 million. Right? So very vast disparities as we go back and forth. Right? Household income, I think you can start to see the trends. Right? Very distinct here. Now this one, those of you who may not be as familiar with Miami, we have a particular problem where a lot of the infrastructure approaches won't work. Miami is based on oolitic formations, which means they're very porous limestone type formations and the water comes up. So you can't build a wall and keep the water out. These little black dots you see up here, septic systems. That's a pleasant thought, right? Okay. Luckily, what we see up here is a lot of those are at the higher elevation, so maybe we have a little bit of time to address that issue. But where those spots on the lower ones, again, we still see that there's going to have to be some different processes of adaptation and risk mitigation as we go along. So what we're really trying to do is we do with this is think about it's not just the elevation that creates the problems. It's all of the other social factors that go along with it. We're still digging into the data. We're trying to get health-related data that goes along with this as well. And I'm going to talk about some future steps to bring in some of the other human elements to increase some of the mapping on this part as well. Uh, but before I do, it's not all like this in Miami. There's some parts of Miami that are the ridges that are a little higher where we still have those very distinct communities. For example, Little Haiti is on a ridge. And it's one of the older communities, one of the poorest communities. 45% are below the poverty line, most of them rent. And what we're seeing is developers are starting to come in to buy that because it's higher elevation. So we're getting displacement there as well. So again, different risk levels, depending on that very micro level of mapping that we can get down to. And so when we think about any given block in Miami, it might look like this, right? From one street to the next, you might have flooding, you might be at risk, and how do we combine those social elements with those geographic elements to create new ways of thinking about this? So one of the things we're doing now is trying to get into the neighborhoods themselves and talk to the people and get them involved so we can create that bridge. Last year we worked with Van Allen, one of our teammates, uh, Joanna, who couldn't be here, with Van Allen and Cleo on a climate lab design. And in fact, Koka from Van Allen is here representing us 
Fiona Wave Cook, right? right? We're doing that again this year, and we're going beyond just the design process on adaptation, but sending them out into the community to do some photo voice elements to get them to focus on the assets in the community, to focus on the threats, and come back and create stories they can share, and they're going to have an exhibition with some of the local policymakers in Miami as part of that. And then based on that, we're going to try and map those to the same geographic type regions and bridge those. Ultimately, our goal is really to change that scale of action where we're bridging the social and the physical and bringing the voices of the community trying to create some creative design processes to solve problems in unique new ways. So, thank you. All right, and our final presenter before we open up for questions is Adam Paris. He's from the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. Great. Last talk of the day. Um, thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm from the Science and Resilience Institute at Jamaica Bay. We're a partnership between the City of New York, uh, the National Park Service, and a group of eight universities or eight research or organizations, uh, principally CUNY, Brooklyn College, where I'm based, uh, Cornell, Columbia, Rutgers, Stony Brook, uh, Stevens Institute of Technology, Wildlife Conservation Society, and New York Sea Grant. And uh, I'm presenting on behalf of myself and my colleague, Katie Graziano, and I have the enviable position of uh, presenting on behalf of my two uh, colleagues, Julie Beagle and Letitia Grenier from the San Francisco Estuary Institute, who do fantastic work uh, out in California. And I want to say, this is not a government planning process. Um, although we partner closely with the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and all, um, New York City DEP, Emergency Management, uh, in some ways, what we're trying to do is actually help build a new uh, process for them to use to help uh, build resilience. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, with this quote from Mark Twain from Life on the Mississippi, where he's talking about his experience becoming a steamboat captain and uh, how he learned the skill of navigating this giant um, ship down the great Mississippi, learning every tide and current and river bend, uh, and he had gained something valuable in terms of his knowledge, but he'd also lost something uh, in terms of the way that he looked at the river. And so I just want to start, lay that, set that out as the context for this particular talk, and I'll come back to it at the end. It's going to be somewhat of a motif. Uh, so uh, first I'd like to talk about our work in Canarsie, in Jamaica Bay here in New York City. And what I want to do is walk through um, the work we're doing in Canarsie from a risk-based perspective. This is very much of the ilk of something that we've been uh, talking about all day in terms of um, the risks, the vulnerabilities, and the hazards, and something that historically, in my experience working in coastal communities, in particular on the issue of coastal climate adaptation for probably uh, 16 years now, um, the way that we tend to enter into this problem. So a little bit about Canarsie. Um, Canarsie's in South Brooklyn. Uh, it's on Jamaica Bay, uh, which is a part of New York City. Uh, it's an estuary that's separated from the Atlantic Ocean by the Rockaway Peninsula. Uh, the Jamaica Bay watershed uh, extends up to northwest Brooklyn, across Queens, and down around JFK. Uh, so that's, uh, just to put that in perspective, you could fit the entire island of Manhattan in this watershed. There's about two million people living there uh, in this watershed, or sewer shed, as some would call it, uh, which is a quarter of the population of uh, New York City. So it's very local in the sense of New York City. When you talk in New York City circles, it's referred to as uh, a local place. Uh, but in some respects, you know, it's very regional or national, not just in, in the sense of population, because two million people would be about the fifth largest city in the U.S., uh, but also in terms of the assets. Um, so JFK is here on the, you can see uh, JFK on the shoreline. 
And then all those areas in green are parklands. There's 10,000 acres of parklands, 7,000 acres are part of the National Park System, Gateway National Recreation Area, and 3,000 acres are part of the New York City Park System. So there's very few areas within New York City, other, other areas in, within New York City where you get this much natural area um, in close proximity to each other. It's incredibly hard hit by Sandy. Um, we know that the risks um, are, are prevalent. Um, all, many of the neighborhoods, all of the neighborhoods really surrounding um, Jamaica Bay are very exposed to flooding. This is work from the New York City Panel on Climate Change looking at tidal flooding or mean monthly high water, which is a metric that looks at the highest of two high tides in a month averaged across a year. So the kinds of floods essentially that you would see a half a dozen to a dozen times a year. Um, for the 2020s, the 20 50s, the 2080s, and out to 2100 with a rap, with a um, accelerated, accelerated rapid ice melt scenario as well. So the basic picture is very much the same uh, as many other areas that are uh, very exposed to flooding due to sea level rise. Things are getting wetter. There are some of these neighborhoods that right now are experiencing floods uh, a half a dozen times a year moving their cars, can't get to school, sometimes sanitation can't come pick up the garbage. Um, it is definitely an at-risk area. Um, this is another picture of that from some scenario analysis that we did uh, where we looked at two different scenarios of sea level rise, 15 inches and 36. That's based on the MPCC estimates around the 2060s. And uh, comparing to, uh, there's three different scenarios for each time frame. One is uh, a future without action if we did nothing to the landscape today. Um, another one is a storm surge barrier with a little bit of um, uh, ecosystem restoration, wetland restoration, living shorelines, and the like. Uh, and then one with about as much re uh, ecosystem restoration as you could possibly imagine, probably that we, we realistically don't have the resources for. So restoring wetlands to the extent in, they were in 1974 in Jamaica Bay. Um, and what you see, and we're, we're using the flood data, comparing it against the Pluto tax parcel database data uh, from the standpoint of assets, is that between 15 inches and 36 inches of sea level rise, you hit a pretty big tipping point. You're going from 400 assets flooded half a dozen times a year or more um, about 300 to 400 to about uh, 1,500 to 1,800 assets. So again, um, exposure uh, to flooding, and that's, that's a social problem as well. So this is zooming in on Canarsie, looking at the, flood, uh, the current flood insurance rate maps um, and the preliminary flood insurance rate maps if they were redrawn. So the, the flood insurance um, rate maps are expanding. This is, the flood zone is expanding, um, is, is set to expand, and that's going to drastically um, increase the flood insurance premiums in Canarsie. So it's going to get really a lot more expensive to live here, even as um, some of the residents of Canarsie are dealing with new zoning changes. Uh, in the wake of Sandy. Specifically, a lot of people bought their homes um, with the idea of renting out the ground level as an, a separate apartment and using that rental income to pay for their mortgage. Now, to make people more resilient and floodproof those bottom layers, or those bottom floors rather, um, where we, the city has prevented um, people from renting those bottom floors. So you're seeing really high rates of foreclosure already in Canarsie. So this is, this is what happens when, when you get into the data. And this, this kind of risk analysis is incredibly important. It's something that I know I've done in my career, many of us have done, um, and it's, it's important to look at the drivers, um, what's, what people are, the stresses and disturbances that people are exposed to. Um, but it leads you to a conclusion or a question, at what point managed retreat, which is, of course, why we're here today. Um, now I want to look at Canarsie from a community-based perspective, the other way around. We've been working with residents in Canarsie to get a sense of what is the culture of the neighborhood and, and what is vibrant 
about the neighborhood. And it's a fantastic place. You've had generations of people from the Caribbean come and live in Canarsie. It's a really important fixture in the history of New York City. At one time, Canarsie Pier um, was a central node for uh, transportation as people from Manhattan and other parts of the city uh, back in the early 1900s would come to Canarsie, use Canarsie Pier, jump over to the Rockaways and spend time in the Rockaways on the weekends. Um, uh, then it's subsequently changed, um, and there is there are uh, folks who've lived in Canarsie for 20, 30 years and want to continue to uh, invest in youth and in the culture in Canarsie. So there's a lot of investment in this place, and there's really a thriving uh, community here. They're creative, um, as you'll see in a second. They have multicultural day every year. Um, hundreds of people come out. It's fantastic. So um, what we wanted to do was create a, a different kind of resilience planning process, something that um, the community could own. And, and so what this looks like, this cycles, we teamed up with an organization called Public Agenda. Um, Public Agenda has been around for 40 years. They support deliberative democracy. Uh, and they've helped design participatory budgeting processes across the world. Um, and we really wanted to take um, step outside of the scientific community, learn from their techniques in civic engagement and participatory budgeting, and apply those to a, a process to build resilience in Canarsie and, and hopefully elsewhere in Jamaica Bay. And this looks a lot like the cycle we saw earlier this morning from Richard and Susie, the capacity building process, right? Frame things out, um, get uh, folks to understand the problem, set some goals and uh, ideas, and it's a cycle because it's very iterative and there's a lot of learning that takes place. Um, we're working, in addition to public agenda, we're working with a group, uh, community working group, so uh, a set of community leaders and community-based organizations, and, and we're really trying to help um, basically design this process to where they can take it over. That essentially, we're here, um, but they will own it over the long, ter long term. Um, we designed uh, Jamaica Bay Jeopardy. Um, so this is an online game, uh, and it's designed to sort of e educate people about Canarsie. Um, not just Canarsie residents, but other uh, government practitioners and scientists. So we, we uh, had one standalone event. Uh, we're set to have more where uh, residents come out and scientists come out, folks from the mayor's office, and they play in teams together. Um, and uh, we have our host here in the tie. Treston is our, our engagement specialist, um, and he's also a Canarsie resident, um, and he's our Alex Trebek. And so you played the game, and you had people um, really hashing it out at the tables, getting to know each other, trying to come up with the answers, and we have all sorts of prizes, including boat rides on our, our research vessel, and we're going to go do that tomorrow afternoon. We quickly realized that Jeopardy can't just be this online tool. That, that's great that it's online and it's free, but not everybody wants to be online or not everybody is online in Canarsie. So we created this offline version that's just a card game. And this is us at uh, Treston doing his Alex Trebek thing at Multicultural Day. Um, and uh, so he's using a card-based version of Jeopardy. And what we're finding is um, Jeopardy is fantastic for building social ties and for educating. It's, it's a light immersion. It's not a deep immersion in the kinds of topics I was presenting um, and the level of detail when you get into the data. But it's a fantastic way to start to build relationships and, um, and build social ties. As you get into the community-based approach, you kind of reach another conclusion. That is, how do you improve the status quo in places like Canarsie? That's what we hear. That's what we're hearing from them, that they want to know, how do we improve the status quo? And um, that's, that's partly about climate. They're concerned about climate, and it's definitely on their radar. It's no secret to many of them that um, Canarsie is flooding uh, more frequently, but they're also worried about gentrification and about crime and affordability and stress. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is not just bring science, that's a hugely important component, right? Science and Resilience Institute, it's in the name. Um, but also context, uh, advice, and training, hopefully to bring about positive social and environmental change. So we adapted the process. 
Um, and I know this is a lot more complex than the, the sort of one cycle diagram, but this is really how it plays out if you're actually going to take community concerns seriously and what engagement looks like. So the first change we made is we know that Jeopardy is going to continue to happen all through the process, Jeopardy and beyond. Jeopardy has been a really interesting way for us to continue to connect to not only to this one neighborhood, but different generations within the neighborhood. We've made a youth version. We've made a, um, a version for all ages. We've made a version for, for just adults. Um, we've made, we're going to make a version for teachers to bring into the classroom. Um, so that will continue and be sustained by the community. So they continue to build social ties, and we build social ties with them, which really lays the foundation for the harder work ahead. Another um, thing we did is that we were going to go from this phase where you start mapping the bay and forming goals and ideas, and we heard that they want action. So we're actually jumping, bypassing that, and jumping straight from the conversation about hopes and concerns to idea fairs. And then we're going to take those ideas, and by virtue of the fact that we have folks from participatory budgeting working on our team, we're going to align that with um, the part next uh, participatory budgeting vote led by city council in the spring. Um, so that's a priority by the mayor's office. And then we can go over the longer term, start doing this kind of scenario analysis and the more sort of risk-based risk -based approach looking at indicators of quality of life and social and community resilience. So we're balancing risk-based and community-based approaches, or we're hoping to. This is not a finished product. And, and I guess I wanted to say that, you know, I, I think that these different perspectives, depending on how you approach it, predisposes you to how you think about the nature of working with coastal communities. There are reinfor it reinforces your thinking in ways that can be both constructive and deconstructive. And that's an important research question for the adaptation community. Really quickly in the Bay Area, I'm going to do my colleagues in justice. Um, they're looking at this from a nature-based perspective. So this is Highway 37. It, on the ground, it looks like another flooded road. You can see, though, that that flooded road's in, a, in, in an expanse of major open space that bisects three different counties. So what they're saying is, what if we looked at the bay and the planning zones from a nature perspective, bigger than a project, bigger than a city, um, but smaller than a county, which would have to meet, which would mean communities working together. Um, and what they've built that into is an adaptation atlas to give people viable options, bundle adaptation solutions instead of the three generic sort of protect, stay in place, retreat. Um, actual viable options. And we're starting a collaborative dialogue, and we'd love for all of you to join with us because we think people need promising ideas and solutions, and that's happening in multiple geographies. So coming back to the two views of a river, this isn't just um, a difference between sort of looking at it from the standpoint of a captain versus somebody enjoying a steamboat ride. This is really down to the level of human cognition. Um, this is horizontal and vertical integration in our psychology. So this is like when we start talking, getting into the topic of adaptation on the coast, we're reaching into a thing that's much more about just where we live and how we live, although those are incredibly important. It's actually down to human potential. Thanks very much. I'd like to invent, invite all the presenters back up for questions. I think we have about 20 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll start off. I have a, a question. Uh, you know, it was touched on a little bit here. Um, you know, so we're very much dependent on disaster recovery to try and build resilience. Uh, and at that time, you know, we saw in the Chris Christie example, uh, everything from the state all the way down to the local level, all the incentives are there to just get people back in their homes, but it, it really limits our adaptation and resilience building options. Um, but as you develop programs or, uh, you know, at the state and the federal level, because you can have that higher view, um, to try and incentivize that proactive approach to building resilience adaptation that's needed for a managed retreat, um, you still kind of have a uh, an attention to just the immediate needs and the short term at the local level. 
uh, that can water down th those approaches. So um, perhaps this isn't a question for the first two presenter groups. Um, what insights do you have to, to in increase the uptake of that proactive approach? <laughs> or, <laughs> Everybody, I don't want to talk at once. Right? I think it's you know I think FEMA is starting on the on the federal level, and this is a really good start. What they what they passed last year and with BRIC, um, I think on the federal level too. Another great partner of disaster recovery is HUD. And they need to figure out kind of what their portfolio looks like when it comes to re recovery and resiliency and mitigation. Um, the way we're looking at it, this does need to be proactive rather than reactive, especially in terms of communities planning and being prepared um, to, to have funding available to run these programs. And I think that does come down to the community level at that point in time. Um, you know, Disaster recovery is very reactive in terms of, and that's and that's what you hear from politicians. All your your communities and your homeowners are not in their home anymore, and all you want to do is just get them back into their home. So that's why you hear that timeline. We'll get you back in their home. That never happens. We also had to manage those expectations and figure out how to do that, but that that never happens. But if we can have plans, especially when it comes to community-based resiliency interventions like buyouts or other things that are ready to go when significant portions of money come in, when states are able to budget this money. I think that's really important. And so I think you know, the, what the states and local communities need to do is work hand in hand with the, with the federal government and come up with a way to be more proactive, how to get the support needed in what you were designing for. And then, and then the funding is always the biggest issue, and we really need the federal government and also, you know, communities that aren't necessarily affected by repetitive flooding or disaster. I think we're sitting here in New York. We're talking about Florida, Louisiana, California. They've all been hit multiple times in the last decade, but that, you know, it's going to expand. You know, Colorado, the the Midwest are going to continue to be hit. So I think we just need to all be thinking about, you know, what this happens. I think that. Um in the previous session that uh, I attended, and I don't remember which one it was, but that was, um, you know, a, a common thread that wove through that one as well, right? I mean, these communities are communities that have an identity as a community and in these places, and in the absence of these major events, don't want to think about relocating and moving. So, you know, as a, as a government, you have the tools that you have available to you, and you try and uh, get them out there and communicate them to people in a way that is easily understandable, but to some extent, unfortunately, there isn't always a, a buy-in and a willingness in the absence of, um, you know, a major event and, and an imminent uh, threat. Tyler, Adam, anything to add from the community perspective on how they can get that buy-in? Um, well, you know, I think oh, I would put forward that our, our Processes like ours, which I've seen a lot of examples of today, so like what I just presented is not is not unique. I think help build social capital and open up a conversation space. Um, so you know we may we may still be stuck with situations where we don't make major steps forward in adaptation until after an event happens, but we'll make no steps forward in the wake of a, an event if there's not already social capital there. So I, I guess I, I tend to think that like the near term and long term don't have to be one or the other. It's not binary. You can pursue those on multiple paths. And if you're doing it with the community, with the, with the community and you're building essentially a willingness on all sides and accountability on all sides, if an event happens, um, then there's a much greater um, space for different solutions, including potentially relocation. Yeah, I would echo those sentiments. I think one of the things that can be done is bringing in, when we have a lot of community groups who are working on kind of the long-term planning for after disasters, and we're starting to see connections with them, thinking about that long-term process of sea level rise and climate change as well. And so building into those connections beyond just that disaster and continuing. I have a project working on building resilience hubs now for centers of community that are most at risk, and that can be after disaster but then continuing and making connections to bring in resources long-term. 
And the only other note that I'll make, which is not necessarily on the federal level at least, but um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they're doing this program called the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, where they are, one, making sure that there's a consistent approach and training for providers of developing these type of community-based conversations. Um, and, and secondly, they are providing the funding to get those plans in place. So having the conversations, having those plans in place, having a set of actions and priorities that the community has defined so that when it comes to it, and thankfully Massachusetts hasn't had a major hurricane impact the area in quite some time, but when it comes to it, that they would have something that they can say, this is what we plan on doing. This is what we're sticking by. This is what we've all agreed to. And it's bringing those different sectors to one place to make that decision. Um, kind of jumping off of that question, I was curious for the um, presenters from the Department of State, um, one of the things that you talked about was that once you've done kind of a risk assessment, you're also working with communities to prioritize assets. And so I was curious how you determine who in the communities to work with and what some of the tools are that you use to do that community engagement around asset prioritization. Sure. So the original um, plat platform for deploying the risk assessment process was during the New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program. That was kind of the first use of that process. And that was kind of a combination, I believe, of kind of governor's office staff determining kind of a, a committee per community. And I think there was a kind of a range of folks. I'm not sure if there were any electeds or not, but trying to represent kind of all the communities in those committees. And then the process is really community driven. It's really bottom up. So we're not saying here are the assets. We're saying you guys tell us what are your assets? How are you valuing their, you know, are they high, medium, low value to you? And then prioritization again, that kind of relates to levels of risk, community value, and other kinds of factors like, you know, socioeconomic impacts and things like that, so. Yeah, it's really trying to give the communities the tools to be able to look at and prioritize themselves, what they see as the most important projects, and engaging them throughout the process. And we found that that was a really good benefit for getting buy-in from the community for those projects that you're recommending to improve resilience because they're discussing it and coming up with them on their own and going through the tool. And at the same time, while they're doing that, really building a, a solid foundational understanding of what the risks are in the community. And it was really kind of the same idea for picking the, the members of the committee. It was the community came to us and told us you know, there were people who kind of already floated to the top. We didn't have like the whole community saying, we want to be involved in this. They kind of elected officials themselves, elected people themselves to join and talk and speak on their behalf to, to take these projects and then these people brought it back to the rest of the community. And I believe those meetings, a lot of them were also public, right? right? Yeah. So it wasn't just the members of the committees, but they were open to and um, able to be attended by anyone in the public who was interested. Hi, um, I just wanted to, so it's one theme that I heard across many of the speakers is the kind of utility and power of mapping and tools to identify risk, but I thought I was really interest, uh, interested by the last presentation where you said the community kind of wanted to skip that, t that step around mapping. So I just wanted to hear more about that and um, although mapping can be really useful, kind of the, how you adapted and um, yeah, kind of responded to that interest of just moving straight to solutions instead of doing any more mapping of concerns and such. Um, sure, thanks for your question. Um, one of the things that we learned pretty quickly is that there had already been uh, a bunch of community engagement through the New York Rising process and through other um, uh, planning processes in the wake of Sandy. So, so it's important to recognize when I say that there was there were a couple of things driving it. One, they had already gone through this process to identify a number of projects, and they wanted to see, you know, can we get some of these projects done? Um, and and two, you know. <laughs> right now, in in many neighborhoods around Jamaica Bay in New York City, study or research those are four letter words. Um, people just don't uh, don't want to hear that 
first. And so we felt like because a process had already occurred and because these, these solutions weren't just hastily drawn, they were actually things that people had talked about and thought through, um, we didn't need to do that again. Um, so that was the conscious choice that we did, knowing that we'd still like to pick that conversation back up. We're just getting to that spot, yeah. We haven't actually dove into the communities at that kind of level. Um, yeah, I don't have a, a good answer for that, except that it really comes down. Some of the things that I've noticed as we've been working over the year, we've had a lot of these community engagement meetings. We have all kinds of open forums. But in a lot of ways, it seems like the people who are able to attend them aren't the ones who are most at risk oftentimes, right? The people who are most at risk are economically vulnerable. They're busy working, taking care of their family. They don't have time to go to the meetings or the meetings aren't accessible. And so getting that voice becomes very difficult and making that connection becomes very difficult. So I don't know it's necessarily the policymakers don't care as there's not an easy way to make any kind of connection between them and forming those relationships becomes a critical part of it. Um, we're going to try and be working through some of that over the next year or so and seeing what we can do. But I don't have a lot of experience to give a direct answer at this stage with it. Well, I, I guess for, for, our, for our part, the, the institute is actually, um, so right on up to the executive committee of the institute, which is basically like our board, we have commissioner level folks um, from the city and from the National Park Service and regional directors from the state, and then we have community organizations. So like behind this process is a larger partnership um, that I think sort of, uh, hopefully institutionalizes accountability. Um, and so, you know, sort of the type of organization that was mentioned in this, this morning's panel, the first plenary panel. Um, and so uh, the other thing I'd say, two other, just two quick things. One, um, I think there, there is reticence. We know for a fact there's reticence um, right now to go into the communities from some of the folks who do have power and resources because they can't readily deliver the solution. Um, and, and that's not for lack of trying, certainly not at the staff level and like the mayor's office of resiliency, you know. Um, so what they're saying to us is the fact that you guys are helping the community stand this process up and that they can own it means that then we can come and it's not under the auspice of a specific plan or a specific decision. It's under the auspice of generally making this neighborhood more resilient. And that helps. It's a small, you know, it's a small thing, but it actually helps a lot. And then finally, what I'm really excited about is as we get into that sort of last loop, the final thing, um, we're going to start playing around with the science of storytelling um, and really creating um, stories that are sort of ethnographically and anthropologically, you know, derived, but also just informally derived with the community. So actually putting on paper, not exhaustively, but putting on paper, helping them sort of make sure that their story as they see it is, is out there, and that's a voice. Um, and that can't be ignored. Hi. Um, I, my name's Karina, and I work with uh, New York State Homeland Security and Emergency Services, and we administer the FEMA grants for mitigation and post-disaster, you know, recovery efforts. Um, I feel compelled to just spend a second setting a little context for this question and also because I think it may be of interest, um, is that in New York State we are, we've partnered with a, a data science lab at the Research Foundation under the uh, State University of New York to develop a, and a web-based kind of asset uh, inventory and resilience screening uh, 
application. And as part of this, it, it's, it's statewide and looking at, you know, we have 5.3 plus million buildings to evaluate um, using an aggregate of multiple building rating tools to, um, to help communities, obviously, to help drive the planning efforts and then also to help the state, you know, government officials who administer programs um, prioritize and then uh, assess for, of eligibility for funding on these actions that they're planning for, right? Because we also work in confines of very specific requirements for cost effectiveness um, and eligibility under, you know, getting the grants that we can administer. And one of the important pieces that we're looking at right now is looking, looking to in incorporate social vulnerability factors into the risk equation, right? So we're, we're in, you know, historically, and I think traditionally, we look at this as an overlay. We look, we look at it as an after thing. We can kind of put it on after. We can, we can evaluate it. Um, but it's not built in, which means it can't really support a benefit cost analysis. Um, and so I'm wondering if, especially at the community level, if you've had any success in doing this, if you're looking, you know, doing any of this research into putting, putting social vulnerabilities um, and some of those some of those algorithms, right, into like building the, into the risk, risk factors, um, and if you've been successful in that, and, and if the Department of State is working on that at all also, so. Um, I guess I'll say, Karina, that in terms of mapping that social vulnerability, it's not something that we are currently doing. What we have for our risk assessment tool is more of that qualitative factor about whether the asset serves socially vulnerable populations or not. I have seen other efforts, I think there's one in Monroe County that did really an integrated kind of social and kind of hazard overlay mapping and I think it's really of interest. Um, so yeah, I will just say at least for now, we're not doing that, but it's certainly something that we are thinking about. Uh, Karina, the only thing I'll say is that um not necessarily from the FEMA side where there, there are some efforts from a national scale where that's been done. I know that the Corps of Engineers is doing that to some um, extent as part of their New York, New Jersey Harbor and tributary uh, study that's really you know more focused on the New York, New Jersey study area, not necessarily beyond the state. But that data does exist um, and I, I'm pretty sure that the calculations and the data set behind that does exist as well. So I'm happy to help connect you with somebody who, who had been part of that process. Um, they're taking it from a census and I think a census block level. So it's very low, you know, high scale. It, digging down into the really deep, smaller, you know, um, uh, pieces is, is just really data intensive and so it kind of does depend on on the level of the study. Yeah, and we are we are working with a lot of I mean the folks from the National Risk Index and everyone working in so the social vulnerability at University of Arizona. It's more about like figuring out how to disaggregate that and put it in the at the parcel level, which is really where we have to do our risk evaluation and where we have to and and then trying to really intersect those those um, risk components with, with transportation and access to education and water and all, you know, everything that goes into that. It's just such a, a, a large effort and such a, I mean, such a dynamic research kind of <laughs> field, but. I mean, we've, we've done a little bit of this too and um, largely working with uh, folks from the New York City Panel on Climate Change. Leslie Patrick has done some of this through her dissertation research. She does a lot of the mapping for MPCC. Um, and and I know MPCC's looked at SOV and other ways of, of calculating that. So yeah, we've we've looked at that um, in Jamaica Bay, and we've worked with a little bit of that data. Um, the reason I was looking at Carolyn is because we're also doing this project um, for the NYSERDA and for the Department of State. It's more related to natural and nature-based features, but we've been developing monitoring protocols um, for different uh, to help produce a comparative analysis and assessment of different ways of managing shorelines from the sort of more nature friendly to the more hard structural. And I think it's really, you know, to the state's credit, uh, very forward looking that those monitoring protocols include measuring socioeconomic benefits. Um, and so that's actually on the ground data collection to look at um, social and economic factors, not necessarily of vulnerability, but of benefits. 
Okay. Um, I guess this question is for you, Adam, because when I seen the word canarsi, um, I, I can't help but to think of my ancestors. I couldn't help but to think of my ancestors when I see the word or hear the word Canarsie. And um, earlier today we had a uh, relative of mine who is of the Matinecock tribe, which is kind of right across that bay. And um, a lot of times when people think of New York City, they say, oh, the Indians gave New York City for hanks of wampum, but they didn't realize that it was actually the Canarsie people who had to give up their land. Um, and so I'm not really sure what efforts um, or my question is what efforts uh, are being done with maybe not the Canarsie um, or even the Matinecock because they're not even state recognized um, as Shinnecock from a federally recognized tribe um, those are sister tribes and, and, and because we're able to be invited to these spaces we can kind of echo their voices um, because a lot of times in different um, legislations and different committees, um, there's always state representation or federal representation, but the others are just, but they still have a voice. And I was just really curious to know if you're working with or if, if there have been any efforts to work with um, any of the tribes um, that exist in, in those areas. Unfortunately not. Um, and that's something we would like to do more of. But I, again, not to not to beat a dead horse, but part of this whole thing about you know articulating the stories is actually reaching back into even some of the um, tribal origins um, of the communities around Jamaica Bay, um, and making sure that story is told, and also the story of white flight in Canarsie. Um, and there's definitely there are definitely other you know injustices that need to be uh, articulated and told and that's part of the whole equation of accountability so unfortunately no the answer is we haven't been able to but we would love to well thank you and um, I definitely can put you in touch with uh, the chiefs and the uh, the governments of those particular uh, communities because I think it's important um, so that these stories they're not just stories about our injustices but it's also stories on how we like I said earlier can go forward um, how they lived in those areas and how they preserved those areas are ways that we can figure out today how to do so going forward thank you okay with that can we give a hand to our presenters